Welcome to the second session for today. The topic for today's second session is uh, recent changes in the ITR and the common uh, filing considerations. To elaborate on this topic, we have with us C. A. Shashank Mehta. He will be uh, taking us through the changes in the ITR, also specifically dealing with the revision in the schedules. Then he will also be doing the amendments that are some of the amendments that are relevant for the filing of assessment year uh, 23 24. Also, the much awaited uh, discussion that is the e campaign AIS reporting and the uh, how to reply to those AIS notifications that he will be covering today. To give the formal introduction of the speaker, I would like to invite CA Jain Shakari to the basket. Meeting. Thank you, Puri Madam, for giving me this opportunity to introduce our speaker for the second session. Second session, we have with us CA Shashank Mehta. Shashank, if I'm not wrong, I think you are our seasonal speaker, right? And that too on a very important topics, ITR. We are heading towards the ITR filing season and uh, Shashank uh, Mehta, Shattered Accountant, he is with us. So what is going to cover, it has already been discussed by our convener. So to formally introduce CS Asang Mehta, he's a qualified chartered accountant and graduate in law. He's practicing CA and his core area of practice, it is of the income tax litigations, representations and the advisory. He's also the content writer. He's contributing the articles in the various journals of the ICAI, CTC, Taxman, etc. He's a speaker at a various seminars organized by the ICAI and other professional bodies. He's a regular visiting faculty at the KC Law College, Siddharth Law College, and the coaching institutes of the CA on a various curriculums. So with this brief introductions, we welcome you, C.A. Shashank Mehta, at our J.B. Nagar CPA study circle on a very important topic. To, to present the momento, I would like to invite our past convener, C.A. Seema Mehta, Madam. Okay, sir, now dice is yours. Very good morning, one and all. First of all, I'll like to express my heartfelt gratitude towards the entire team of JV Nagar Study Circle, who has been consistent enough to, you know, give me this prestigious IS to present my thoughts on this topic that is changes in the ITR from last almost, I think, three or four years. I'm very much grateful to that. 
with today's first session we had toured around certain disputed countries like china russia ukraine us etc now i think it's time to come back to india and also deal with certain due dates which are approaching very soon my today's session is concerned and focused only on certain changes and amendments which are relevant for filing the itrs of assessment year 22 23 and certain common issues which are generally faced by you know professional or even by the taxpayers by the assessees while filing the return of income we'll have some interaction session also absolutely because this is a compliance based session naturally there will be you know practical issues which will be coming up in each case so for each client for each assessee so we'll be try to we'll try to deal you know at the most at least to come to a up most appropriate i can say conclusion so with this in the name of almighty and my parents and gurus i seek your permission to start with this today's session first of all as we have been knowing that in last 2 3 years i mean i i think last 4 years the government has been very much proactive in at least notifying the itrs well before time earlier you know even after the end of that particular financial year the notice itrs were not notified last 2 3 years they have been notified well, well before time and this year surprisingly even the utilities are out you know the filing has already started people have already filed the return of income so it is going very smooth regarding the applicability of certain specific itrs to the specific assessees there is as such no change with respect to the eligibility criteria or i can say specific itr applies to what kind of assessees there is no change as such except for one small change which we will be dealing so itr 1 to 6 has been notified way back in february itr 7 also way back in february if i talk we'll just run through the eligibility criteria of all the itrs itr 1 most important thing to be remembered is it is applicable only for resident and ordinary resident if you are r but nor then you cannot file itr 1 same way it is applicable only for those assessees who are having one house property one house property so if you are having a very simple salaried individual but is having two house property then also you cannot file itr 1 that is what is needs to be considered okay in filing itr 1 who are not eligible to file itr 1 the list is given over here if you are a director in the company if you are invested in unlisted equity shares if if it is a case where tds is deducted deducted under section 194 n or if there if you have deferred your esop or the last one which is a new this is i can say non eligibility criteria given in this particular year itr will be discussing in the later part a very small change same way itr2 for individual and hf for not carrying out any business or profession itr3 for all the individuals and hf who are having business income itr4 our favorite itr that is uh, the presumptive taxation however in that case also you have to ensure that the total income in that case should not exceed 50 lakhs so if it is exceeding 50 lakhs then you have to file idr 3 not idr 4 same uh, that i can say non eligibility conditions are there which are enlisted the same uh, like if you are a director in a company if you are invested in a un, uh, unlisted equity shares or if you are having deferred esop then you cannot use idr 4 you have to use idr 3 idr 5 generally used for the partnership firms idr 6 for companies other than those covered by section 11 and itr7 again for all the trust institutions and other categories of charitable institutions which are covered just a small brief introduction to all the ideas now seventh proviso to section 1391 which was introduced in finance act 2019 it requires that even if your total income is less than the basic exemption limit then also as such by the main section you are not covered you are not liable to file your itr but by virtue of this proviso you are mandated required to file that itr even though your basic income total income is less than that basic exemption limit so what is the first criteria the first criteria is when the assessee deposits an amount or aggregate of the amount exceeding rupees 1 crore in one or more current accounts maintained with a banking company or a cooperative bank so even if your income is less than 2.5 lakhs but in your current accounts if there are total deposit i am not talking about cash deposits i am talking about any deposit If the entire credit side is exceeding rupees one crore, then you are required to file your return of income. Same way, if the assessee is incurring an expenditure of an amount or aggregate of an amount exceeding rupees two lakh for either himself or for any other person, 
for a foreign travel. So if you are expending for yourself or for anyone, be it your relative, be it your friends, be it for anyone, but if you are incurring more than two lakh, and even if your income is less than basic exemption limit, then also you are required to file your ITR. Same way, if you have incurred expenditure exceeding rupees one lakh for consumption of electricity, so the electricity payments which are made by you are exceeding rupees one lakh, then also even though your income may be nil, then also you are required to file your ITR. And there are certain certain other conditions also, which are notified by notification number 37 of 2022, which was even discussed in the last year's session. The very first one is, if the assessee's total sales turnover from business exceeds rupees 60 lakh, then also that person is required to file ITR, even if his income is less than 2.5 lakh. So here for business, it is 60 lakh. Same way for profession, if the gross receipt is, is exceeding rupees 10 lakh, then that particular professional is required to file the ITR. Another category is where the TDS and TCS, the body uses and in between. So aggregate of TDS and TCS to your credit is if it is exceeding rupees 25,000, if you are not senior citizen, then also you are required to file your ITR irrespective of whether your taxable income is there or not. Whereas if you are a senior citizen, then this limit of 25,000 has been enhanced to 50,000 rupees. And the last one again, the deposit in one or more saving bank account of the person in aggregate is rupees 50 lakh or more during the previous year. So this is also one of the important conditions that irrespective of whether you earn income or not, if in your saving bank account, if the deposit are exceeding rupees 50 lakhs, then you are required to file return of income. In case of certain people, uh, you know, certain individuals like, say for example, uh, any person who is not earning anything, say for example, there's a person who is aged 58 years, he's not working now, his son is working. Now that person as such is not required to file ITR. However, the son, is giving the, his father some maintenance or some he's availing any loan or anything. Say suppose at the age of 58, he's availing any housing loan and the amount is getting credited to his bank account, his saving bank account, if at all is, it is coming through that route. And in that case also, even though he has no return, uh, taxable income, still he is required to file his ITR. Obviously, the total income in that case will be zero, but he will be required to file at, at his report that he is filing this return pursuant to seventh proviso. To section 139.1. So that if you start the idea, the very first page which will appear is under which section you are filing return of income, whether under 139.1 or whether it is in pursuance of seventh proviso to section 139.1. So that is what you are required to report over here. Then I'll be dealing with certain changes. This year, there have been very few, very few changes which are made in the ITR. I have covered those changes over here. The very first change as I said, regarding the eligibility to file ITR-1. Just a few minutes back, we discussed about the seventh proviso, the very first condition. If at all, in your current bank account, there is a deposit of more than one crore, then you are required to file return of income. Up to last year, in last year, such kind of person, even though in his current account, if he's receiving more than one crore, he was at least allowed to file ITR-1. So maybe he must have discontinued his business but still is having a current account and there are a deposit in that current account, maybe of a personal nature or any, any kind of deposits, not necessarily that it will be business deposits. Up to last year, such kind of person was eligible to file ITR-1. From this year, they have shut down that window. You cannot file ITR-1. You can file ITR-2. Okay. So there is one of the basic question that if there is a current account and there are deposits in that current account, how will you even allow ITR-2? Because if there is a current account, it's generally presumed that there is business. But I think it will cover a scenario where the business is done, current account is there, but still there are deposits which are not related to business in any sense. So maybe for that, at least they have kept that window open for of ITR too. Absolutely, very much possible, sir. Very much possible. Another change in ITR 5, 6, and 7, in the assessment year 2021, they had introduced this drop down of what are the types of property which are held by that particular SSC, whether it is self-occupied, whether it is deemed let out or it is let out. So that self-occupied was introduced in assessment year 2021 for the first time. Earlier, it was only two categories. I am not able to make out what was the reason for introducing that SOP for companies or for firm because as per section 23 or as per section 24, for SOP, the ALV will be nil only if the owner occupies that premises. 
for his residential use. Now, a company or a firm cannot reside anywhere. They can have office, they can occupy an office, but they cannot reside. So, it was altogether illogical to introduce that particular drop down. So, now they have removed that drop down. And even otherwise, what used to happen is after the introduction of the drop down, people used to report their office premises in that SOP. So, I used to select SOP and I used to write my office premises XYZ address and this is my SOP. So, I'm occupying, I'm, I'm, I'm filing ITR 6 or ITR 5. Now, because this SOP drop down is done away with, I don't think so. Even that is required now to report. And even otherwise, I'll say if, if I talk legally, Section 22 itself prohibits any kind of property which is used for the purpose of business, it will be outside the ambit of Section 20, 22. Once it is outside the ambit of Section 22, there comes no question of classifying it as a SOP. Okay, so even legally, it was wrong to say that I, this particular premise is for a company, this particular premise is a SOP. If I talk about section 22, just a small change. Now there is no drop down to select SOP in case of ITR 5, ITR 6, ITR 7. So yes, definitely if you are having lot many offices and branches, you are not as such required to report in that house property schedule that what kind of property is that. Because if you are using it for the purpose of business, it is altogether outside the ambit of section 22 itself. Again, a small change with respect to rate of taxation for dividend taxation, I'll say. Before the abolition of the dividend distribution tax, the dividend income which was earned by a domestic company from other companies, other domestic companies, was exempt under Section 10, Clause 34. However, if the domestic company was receiving any kind of dividend from a foreign company, specified foreign company when the holding is, you know, more than 26%, etc., all these criteria were there. So if the dividend was flowing in from that particular foreign company, then in that case, it was taxable, and it, but it was taxable at a concessional rate of 15%. So there was a specific line item under the schedule IFOS, where you have to specify the tax or the, the amount of dividend which is received by an Indian company from a specified foreign country, which is taxable under section 115 BBD. Now, after the abolition of the dividend distribution tax, whatever dividend I was receiving from my domestic company was taxed at my slab rate or at the applicable rate. In case of company, it will be that particular applicable rate, 25%, 30%, etc. Now, in order to bring parity for domestic dividend as well as foreign dividend, they have omitted this provision. They have come up, you know, they have rationalized this provision saying that now no more the concessional rate will be applicable, it will be taxed as per the regular rate, which is applicable to that particular company. So this, there was a line item given in schedule IFOS, which has now been done away with, it has been removed, I just striped it off in the last part. Additional disclosure for FPIs and FIIs, foreign portfolio investors and foreign institutional investors. You have to mention in your idea two, three and five, whether you are a PFI or FII or not. So that is an additional disclosure which is required in this year's ITR. They will ask you your SEBI registration number. That registration number is required to be entered over here. Just a small change. Once you say that, yes, you are a FII or FPI, then automatically schedule 112A that is dealing with long-term capital gains for residents, okay, which is not applicable to uh, FPI and FII, it will be automatically disabled. So this is also uh, just a disclosure, I can say reporting requirement which has been brought away, uh, brought in. Another reporting requirement is regarding the donations which you are claiming as exemption under Section 80G. As we have been seeing in last two, three years, there have been several amendments in the taxation of uh, trusts. This is especially to curb all the malpractices which are going on, which are looting through the trust institutions. Now, the even trusts are required to file the statement of donation which they have received in form 10 DB, etc. So now they are linking everything that whatever statement is received from that particular trust by XYZ SSC has given this much of donation. All this has been linked with the ITR also now. So in the ITR, if you are given any donation to any institution which is eligible for you know claiming exemption, you are eligible to claim exemption or deduction under Section 80G. Okay, where 50% deduction is allowed subject to the qualifying limit. In that case, you will have to specify all the details like the pan of the trust, name of the trust, and even your donation reference number. So this is a new thing 
so please, you have to make ensure that you have to ensure that whenever you are filing the itr for your clients which have made such donations you take that arn from them because without arn i don't think so they will process that deduction for you or exemption for you in the 1431 okay so you have to give that reference number there will be a provision there will be a check of that reference number with the form 10 db also and accordingly so they will be matching the data so ensure that you fill in the correct ARN number of that particular donation receipt. Thank you, ma'am. So this is something which the assessee needs to be vigilant about. If you are making donation to a trust, you make sure that you take the receipt and you get that particular number from them. Yes. Yes. according to me if i talk about uh, you know compliance of this particular thing i understand this forms are notified just two months back and this is a new requirement which is coming it's a practical issue but i think you will have to go to the trust again and get that number practically yes practically possible <clears throat> absolutely correct correct it is a practical issue but the vigilant one would you know again approach if the amount is big and obviously if you are claiming the deduction you will have to approach you will have to find a way out for that for your own donation you may not get that online number i don't think so, so yes the, yes please sir, that pan number is given in the website of pm care fund there is a pan number which is given over there There is a FAQ which is providing each of this fund the website, and they have specifically given that what pan we are using, and that is to be mentioned. I think in my last year's presentation, I had even quoted that pan. What pan needs to be given when you are contributing to the PM Care Fund? So that is there on the website. You will get it, sir. Absolutely, fifty percent with qualifying limit. Yes, yes. No, no. <clears throat> ITR five again some changes with respect to the disclosure which are required to be given in case of change in the constitution of the firm. Okay, when whenever there is admission or retirement, you have to give details as to who had who has been admitted or who has been retired from the firm. Two additional disclosure and are now required to be given. That is the pan of that particular partner as well as remuneration which is paid or payable. in case of that retiring partner so if there is a retirement then you have to provide even the amount of remuneration which is paid or payable to that particular partner so this is a just a new additional disclosure requirement which is there in this year's itr form so pan and the remuneration paid or payable in case of a retiring partner itr 3 if i talk about the balance sheet side earlier there was only one column that is advances the borrowings i can say now there is a additional disclosure you have to classify that entire advance into two parts the advances which are received from a specified co uh, person covered by section 40a sub section 2 clause b that is your related party transactions so if you have borrowed any advances or borrowed any loan from those categories of person that has to be re reported separately and from other persons you have to report it separately i think this this kind of details will help the assessing officer at the time of assessment to check whether there is you know the reasonable payment of interest or not whether the rate of interest which you are paying on that particular borrowings whether it is not beyond uh, you know reasonableness so that is i think that would be the utility of this particular disclosure additional disclosure it is already there in itr 5 and itr 6 this kind of uh, bifurcation it was not there in itr 3 now they have provided again a sunset clause for which this schedule has been removed for certain categories of transaction so up to 31st of march 2012 deduction was allowed to certain kind of undertakings which had set up their operations in jammu and kashmir up to 31st of march 2012 if they had started with that production or operations then for 10 years they were allowed this particular deduction now that 10 years has already expired on 31st of march 2022 so that line item in section uh, uh, schedule 80ib of claiming deduction for jammu and kashmir uh, territory or you know 
setting up that plant in Jammu and Kashmir territory has been done away with. They have removed that particular line item from Schedule 80 IB. Facility to transfer TD, TCS credit. This is also an important change and uh, I can say welcoming change. We all are aware since last two, three, I think four years, they have provided a very elaborative schedule for TDS and the transfer of credit of TDS. So if it is of your own TDS, then how will you bifurcate whether it is, even though it might have been deducted in your own hands, but it may pertain to some other person. Then the ITR will ask details of the pan of that particular person. What is the amount, whether it is a broad forward credit, what is the amount of credit which you are going to carry forward. Or there can be a reverse scenario where the TDS has been detected in the name of some other person. However, it relates to you. So now that person will be transferring the credit to you. So in that TDS schedule also, you are, you are allowed to, you know, report the figure which is coming from other person's 26 years. So you have to mention the PAN number. You have to mention what is the amount which you are claiming in your own hands, but it is reported in 26 years of some other person. So such kind of facility was not there in case of TCS. Okay. So now in this year's idea, we have introduced this particular schedule that is schedule TCS it was already there, but these line items have been introduced so that, you know, this particular uh, TCS can be bifurcated in case of, you know, joint deduction, which is made. Now we come to relief under section 89A. I'll explain this particular provision, which was introduced in the last budget with the help of an example. Yes, please, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Correct. If the category is okay. Sir, in case of TDS, if you're talking yes. about TDS, if you go to the portal, say after receiving 1431, there is a mismatch. Yeah, they have not given you that credit. That is a question, sir. Okay. Now, if you go to log into your portal, if you go onto the services tab, service tab in the income tax portal, service tab, you will find one line item tax credit mismatch. Okay. So in that tax credit where they will report all the items which they have disallowed in 1431. Yes. According to me, in that particular reply, you should give the correct details as to how that credit pertains to you. Yes. According to me, that should generally resolve your query. But it is not then, sir, the only option is either you can go for rectification or you can go for appeal. Yes. JAO will not do anything like always. As usual, yes. So this CCS also now you can bifurcate it properly and you can give the other person is there in whose hands this CCS is to be claimed, then that can be done. Can you claim income without that other person having any dependent? Sir, this will be a, a bit a task, I'll say. They will in return of income, you can definitely fill whatever you want to. But while processing, they may raise this query because that person needs to enter the details. So if say, suppose in your hands, the entire TCS has been, you know, deducted or credited. Now in your schedule, you will have to report that out of say rupees 1 lakh 50,000 belongs to me and 50,000 belongs to my wife or some other person. And you have to mention the PAN. So I think there has to be matching between do, these two things. In 1431, if you are not reporting, then definitely it will be getting disallowed. However, again, there were remedies to it, which you can approach. Ensure that at least that person reports it properly. It is as, as simple as that GST is my credit. Okay. Section 89A, a beneficial provision, which was brought in, in the last budget. For the non-resident who were non-resident earlier, but now are settled in India. I'll explain this with help of an example. Say, for example, <clears throat> last four years, I am in India. I am a resident in India. Last four years. Before that, I was a resident of Canada, for example, Canada. Now, I was employed over there in Canada and I had a retirement benefit account in that particular country. Now, that account is, 
is can be you know the amount can be withdrawn from that account only after a span of 15 years or 10 ever what you know in a future longer date and only upon withdrawal i will be required to pay tax in canada at the time of withdrawal so i have left canada since years my account is already there now what happens is as per that tax laws this amount will be taxable say after 10 years in that country but in india because now i am resident in india my global income is taxable and every year i am earning some interest in that particular account which is accrued it is not received by me but it is accrued so naturally even if it is accrued then i i have to pay tax on it so what was happening was i was paying tax on an income which was not even credited to my account and second most important thing is after 10 years i will be paying tax in canada on the entire amount even though i can get the credit of the tax paid after 10 years but what i will do with that credit because in this span of 10 years in india i already paid the tax from my own pocket i have got no credit for that and after 10 years they will give a lump sum credit of that amount in the 10th year what would i do with that credit so this was a practical issue which was faced by certain non resident who had settled back to india okay but they were having certain accounts benefit account uh, employee benefit account in those countries okay so in order to align this align this point of taxation or i can say year of taxation they have introduced this particular section providing that that particular assessee can choose in which year he wants to get his interest or that amount taxed so there is a particular form which is required to be filed that is form 10 e okay this form is required to be filed and in that form you have to report that you wish to tax this amount or you wish to offer to tax this particular amount upon withdrawal of that amount from that foreign country in that year you will pay tax so what in this schedule the entire new schedule has been brought in in this schedule what you have to report is first of all you have to specify whether that retirement benefit account is in a specified country or a non specified country so there are two categories of that only if it is from a specified country then this section can help you otherwise not so presently there are three specified countries that is canada uk and usa these three countries are there in the drop down apart from that you have to then again reply uh, you have to report that what is the amount which has been accrued so you have to include in your ifos it's not that you have to not report no you have to report it you have to specify that in the ifos schedule and after that you will also have you will also get that field i that out of that amount what is the amount you are you know going to defer or what is the amount you are going to claim deduction as of now in this year but you will pay tax later in the year in which that amount will be withdrawn however once you report that amount in this particular column that is income claimed for relief from taxation under section 89a they will give you a pop up that please file or submit your form 10e before filing the return of income before the due date of filing the return of income same way in this schedule itself there is one more line item at the bottom that is i think roman number 4 wherein you are required to specify that if in earlier years you have claimed that deferment and this year that amount has been withdrawn from canada and this year it is taxable in canada and then you have to report that yes this year earlier i deferred it now i am offering it to taxation so this is also a new line item which has been brought in in the idr section 89a taxability of vda that is virtual digital asset commonly known as cryptocurrency there was a huge balloon or i can say i in the last two years what will be the taxation of this that everything i think is now the most have ab itna koi baat karta nahi iske bare mein i kis kis ke andar jana hai but yes definitely taxation is very important so there is a definition given of what is vda that is virtual digital asset under clause 47a of section 2 it inter alia covers this cryptocurrency in short it covers anything which does not have any underlying but it is just based on any promise that's it okay so it is any kind of i can say i cannot even say it asset though legally it is an asset but it is something which we cannot see which cannot feel anything but it is something which has no underlying that's it so cryptocurrencies nfts or any kind of digital asset all these are covered by the definition of section uh, 247a that is vda now 
there are certain categories which the CBDT has excluded, which will not be considered as VDA, even though otherwise they may fall in the definition of VDA. So this is the notification number 74. The very first one is gift card or vouchers. Second is mileage points, reward points or loyalty cards. Subscription to website or platform or application. So these three as such may fall under that complex definition which is given for VDA. However, the government or the CBDT has excluded that no, this will not be covered by the taxation of VDA. Another notification was with respect to NFT that is non-fungible tokens. In this, they had provided that if your VDA or the NFT is ultimately resulting into transfer of the underlying asset and which is legally enforceable, if that is happening, then also it will not be considered as regular VDA or regular NFT for which this taxation provisions are applicable. Okay, so if there is a proper transfer of the underlying asset, which is legally enforceable, then not to worry, it will not be covered by the definition of the VDA. Now, just a brief revision of what is section 115 BBH, that is taxability of the virtual digital asset. It will be taxed at the flat rate of 30%. Deduction will be allowed only for the cost of acquisition, nothing else. Expenditure, allowances, losses of other ads cannot be set off against this kind of income. There will be like operational costs, like cost of mining and other incidental costs, but even those will not be allowed to claim as deduction. Even your basic exemption limit cannot be availed against this kind of income. Say, for example, you have income from cryptocurrency of 260,000, and that is the only income you are having, nothing else. Still, that entire 260,000 will be taxed at 30%. You will not get the benefit of the basic exemption limit. Loss in crypto neither can be set up against any income nor can be carried forward to subsequent years. You cannot do anything with that. Now, this particular provisions are irrespective of whether you treat it as your business income or a capital gains. It has nothing to do with that. This is specific, you know, code in itself, section 115 BBH is a taxability. Irrespective, if you categorize it as a business income, capital gains, whatever, only this particular scheme is required to be followed. <laughs> Government are very reluctant to give any kind of benefit to this. Absolutely, absolutely. So now a very important part in this particular slide, very important part. What I observed is, if I take an example, say for example, I have three types of cryptocurrencies. In two, there is profit of one lakh and in another, there is a profit of 1.5 lakh. So that comes to 2.5 lakh. And in the third one, I have loss of say, again, 1.5 lakh. So overall, if I see, I have profit of only 1 lakh. Rupees. If I talk about the entire cryptocurrency segment, However, as per the provisions of the act, as well as as per the provisions or I can see the field item which they have given in the ITR, you will have to exclude any script, any crypto where there is loss. So now in my example, the entire 2.5 lakhs will be taxed at the rate of 30%. But the loss of 1.5 lakh has to be foregone, it has to be withdrawn. You cannot do anything about it. You can, it, there can be no intra head, there can be no inter head, there can be no carry forward, nothing can be done about it. Even within the same script, say for example, I'll, I'm coming to a next level now. I'm saying I'm having only one type of crypto, one type of crypto, one I have acquired in the month of, say, suppose May, other in the month of August, and third in the month of December. In the March month, I have said, sold all three of them. Same to same script, same to same crypto. In this case, obviously for all three of them, I'll have some different profit and loss. Even in this case, they are saying you have to report your date of acquisition and your cost of acquisition. Uh, I mean, say, uh, date of sale and the purchase cost and the sale cost. And they will automatically exclude all those transactions, independent transactions, wherever you are incurred losses. So it will be automatically reported zero. Once your cost exceeds your sale value, it will be automatically considered as zero. Only the profit figure will remain in this particular schedule. If I show you this schedule, this is the schedule. I can categorize it as my capital gain. I can categorize it as, as my business income. 
it does not make any difference. In the first in the first line item, if you can see the sale value is 25 lakh, the cost of acquisition is 15 lakh, the gain is 10 lakh, 10 lakh subject to 30% of tax. In the second line item, my cost of acquisition is 5 lakh, my sale value is 3 lakh. There is a loss of 2 lakh. But for the purpose of this schedule, it will be considered as zero. Okay, so this is one of the things which needs to be taken into consideration before consulting the client. As I need to buy a script, I have seen that we sell it, so we can net up. You have to report each and every transaction which we used to report in case of 112A when the grandfathering had come. For every script wise reporting was done and date wise, here also date wise reporting is required to be done. So this is go this is going to be a tedious task if there are multiple transactions, you know, which has been taken place by that particular SLC. It is very difficult to explain the client because client will say, "By me, Jeb, me, this is one lakh rupee." It's very difficult to explain them that it's not like that. Then they will blame the government. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Sir, uh, to address your query, there is no direct provision in the Act or in any notification circular for this DDA. But yes, as you said in 2016, we had this circular dealing with shares and securities wherein they are allowed that SSC can adopt FICO matter. But if you are able to correlate each and every transaction, whatever is beneficial to you, I think you should go with that. Yes, please, sir. No, absolutely not. Sir, these are all alternate remedies. You can file whatever you want into ITR. You cannot even try to fill up the schedule. You can go and directly enter into capital region. That is what people used to do. Okay, so that, that all means are available to you. But what is required by the ITR is this. That means you have to file this. Now, disclosure of intraday, again, a very interesting topic. Whenever intraday sort of, you know, shares in capital market comes in picture. Speculation transactions are defined under clause 5 of section 43. Again, the definition says that whenever you're dealing any kind of securities, which has no underlying to it, it will be considered a speculative transaction. However, there is an exception saying that if you're de dealing in derivatives, which are Dealt in a recognized stock exchange, then it will not be considered as speculative. Even though as such they are speculative, but for the purpose of income tax act, they will not be considered as speculative transaction. The formalized derivative transaction, option trading, future trading, etc. Now, if we talk about intraday transaction, intraday transaction are not covered by the exceptions, and these are transactions where there are no underlying. You buy in the same, uh, you buy in the same day, you sell in the same day, and you incur either profit or loss. ICI had a, in their guidelines of 2014 para 5.14, they have stated that how to calculate the turnover for this particular segment. That was only for, you know, I can say recognizing the limit of turnover when it comes to tax audit, the threshold limit. In that, they have reported, they had stated that what you can do is take the modulus of all the negatives and positives. So you may incur like many transactions in a particular day. Actually, if you see the sale value, it may go, it may go into crores and crores and crores. But actual only the net difference is the amount which is considered as turnover. So there can be a negative as well as positive on the same day. So say, for example, in a buy-sell transaction or one transaction, there is, I can say positive 1000 rupees. And for a buy-sell transaction, second transaction, the same day, there is negative 500 rupees. So as such in your pocket, your profit is 500 rupees. But in this case, as per the ICI guidelines, the turnover is 1,500 rupees. So this is how you have to determine your turnover for the purpose of applicability of section 44 AB. Now, in this year's ITR, they have provided a reporting schedule, a disclosure schedule as to from the entire trading account, whatever gross profit you are having. In that gross profit, what is the element of your intraday profit or loss? And what is the turnover there? So this is not a separate schedule which is going to get reflected in your, uh, I can say, PNL account. This is below the line item. After your gross profit, you have to bifurcate that in this gross profit, what is the element of your intraday profit and loss, and what is the turnover there? Now, in this case, 
I don't know how they have structured the ITR. It is very much possible, very much possible that the turnover which you have reported in your trading account may be less than the turnover which is which you derive for the purpose of that uh, this kind of intraday transaction following the ICI guidelines. It is very much possible because as per ICI guidelines, you have to take the modulus. This kind of modulus is only for determining whether the tax audit uh, limit is applicable or not, whether the limit is getting uh, breached or not. You cannot say that this is your actual turnover. No, it's a derived turnover through that particular guidelines. How can I say that 1,500 is my turnover? No. Okay, so yes. Now, while reporting, it is possible that your actual turnover will be less than the derived turnover which you are disclosing in that intraday schedule. I hope they will understand that this possibility is there. But yes, again, it is nothing like this is a new schedule where from which the figures will be reflected ahead. No, it is just a bifurcation. So that is intraday transaction disclosure. Now again, 115 BAC, you know, a topic of every year's opt-in, opt-out. I don't know why they are playing Garba in this unnecessarily. They have even come out with a new form for the next year now. I don't know what is the utility of that form. We'll be discussing maybe in the next week, the next year's IPR. So now, <clears throat> this particular schedule was already there up to last year. They have elaborated this schedule. That is section 115 BAC alternative regime for individual taxation. If at all you are an individual and you want to opt in for the alternative regime, but you are carrying on in a business or a profession, there was a proviso which says that once you opt in, you can opt out only one time. After opting out, you cannot again opt in for that. So in relation to all these details, they have come up with a detailed schedule now. To last year, it was a small schedule. Now, there's a detailed schedule. It will first ask you whether you opted for 115 BAC in earlier years or not. If you say yes, then you have to give the details of your filing of Form 10E as well as uh, subsequent year in which you have opted in. What was the acknowledgement number? If you say no, I had not opted earlier years, then this will be disabled. And then in the second line item, they will ask you whether you want to opt in, opt out, or uh, sorry, whether you want to opt in or not in the last third line item. Whereas, if you say I had already opted, then there will be a new category of reporting that is the second part which I have highlighted, wherein they will ask you whether you have opted out in earlier years or not. Okay, so opt in kiya tha kabhi bhi pehle, you have to report ki konse saal mein opt in kiya tha. Now, second line item will ask you whether after opting in, whether in any previous year you have opted out. If you say yes, then they will again ask you details. Once you say yes to that, automatically all the details which are there in the bottom that you want to continue to opt in that you want to opt in will be disabled only one option will be there that is not eligible to opt in okay so that is the last item which i have uh, which is after the highlighted part that once you say that you already opted out it will automatically display that you are not eligible to opt in so all these permutation combinations are there which they have enlisted in this particular schedule this is a small change again now very important thing very important this instruction are not mine. These are verbatim dicta of what is given in the instructions to the ITRs. So every year the security comes up also with the instruction module, which runs into 300, 500 pages. In this instructions, they have given certain instruction with respect to 115 ESC. Now very first note is option for new tax regime will be available only till from the section 139. But obviously, if you want to opt in for this, you have to file return of income before time or on time and say, and also you have to report that in form 10i. Second note, very important. Taxpayer can opt in or withdraw from the new regime under section 115 BSC in revised return if it is filed in the due date as per section 131. Now I'll have some legal touch to this. This particular instruction permits me to change my category to revise my category in the revised return. Say, pehle mein opt in kiya, now in the revised return I'm opting out. Or mein opt out kiya tha, now in the revised return I'm opting, which is not possible because 10i file nahi hua tha. But first case is possible, mein already opt in kiya hai, regular return bar hai in the new scheme, now I'm opting out by way of a revised return. 
this instruction module says it is allowed but we had a recent supreme court judgment in the case of pcit versus wipro limited there is a specific observation of this honorable supreme court in para 12 of the judgment saying that the revised return are only for omission or any mistake you cannot shift your category from one scheme to other scheme by virtue of revised return so in that case that particular ssc earlier had obtained to claim tax exemption exemption under section 10b that is for ip enabled services however after some point of time they realized that we are having losses so this exemption will not help us let us carry forward that losses let us file a revised return will not claim any kind of exemption at 10b because we are not having any profit but what we will do is losses you have to carry forward that so this might have traveled back to the supreme court supreme court said no your revised return is only for mistakes and omission you cannot just change your scheme for that now this guidelines of cbt according to me if i am a officer assessing officer i will say that these are contradictory to supreme court judgment now say suppose i have for example this thing happens practical that you revise your return you go opt out automatically in the old scheme from new scheme you are going to old scheme in the revised return officer says no you cannot do this by virtue of supreme court judgment i will say ki aapne to instruction mein diya tha they will say no supreme court judgment will you know prevail my argument as a counsel will be the department is covered by the doctrine of promissory estoppel as per the doctrine of promissory estoppel once the department has put in something on the public domain which they have specifically stated this will be allowed now you cannot snatch that benefit again from the ssc so if this matter travels like in in upper forum this will be my argument as such but yes just a legal touch to this discussion just to make it a little bit interesting that's it itr 7 there are few i can say many amendments i have covered certain relevant amendments which are uh, applicable itr 7 if i talk about uh, there was a amendment which was made in finance act 22 with respect to 22nd proviso to section 1023c that is applicable to specified educational institution hospitals etc in that case we all know that there are certain conditions basic condition which are required to be complied that you have to maintain your proper books of account you have to file a return of income on time and you also have to furnish certain kind of reports within that particular time if you are not doing that then automatically that exemption will be disallowed that exemption you cannot claim those exemption now in order to you know specify what all disallowances will be made this particular proviso was inserted 22nd proviso to section 1023c these are the list of items which are given under that particular schedule and in the itr also under schedule t i part b3 they have enlisted all these line items wherein the figures will be auto populated from the other fields of the itr as to what all disallowances are now made to your uh, income and expenditure account on account of disallowance of this particular uh, exemption so expenditure from any corpus standing into the credit of the trust as on the end of the financial year will be disallowed so corpus mein se aapne jo bhi expenditure kiya rahega that will not be allowed in your regular computation you in short you will be covered by the regular computation of the itr expenditure which you made from any loans or borrowings okay which as such are considered as application will not be considered now okay so that can you cannot claim that as your deductions even if you are you know expending it from your loans and borrowings depreciation in respect of any asset acquisition of which has been claimed as application of income okay so if you are applying or acquiring a asset that was considered as application of income such kind of reduction also will not be allowed once you are into you know once you violate all those conditions of not filing itr or tax audit report etc expenditure in the form of contribution donation to any other person so if you are if you are applying your own funds in making donation to any other person that also will not be allowed disallowance will be made also under section 40 clause a sub clause 1a okay that is non compliance of tds this is going to be very harsh because as on the date when you are making such kind of payments you are making in a good faith i assume you are making it in a good faith that yes this is going for this particular donation just because at the time of itr you filed that itr late entire thing will be gone and now if you have made that particular payment which is otherwise subject to any kind of tds provisions then even that amount will not be allowed to you any kind of expenditure 
Same way, disallowance under 40A3, that is cash uh, payments paid. No deduction will be allowed for the expenditure not incurred in India. So if you are if you're made a donation or any kind of expenditure outside India, it will also not be allowed. So this is the, that particular new schedule which has been introduced in the idea 7. Okay, most of the figures will be auto populated from other fields. Additional details, very small change in details of author, founder, trustees. Earlier, you have to report the details of all the author, founder, trustees, manager as on the date of that particular application, whenever you have made the application for the registration of the trust. Now they have changed it and as at the end of the year. So at any point of time, whosoever are the trustees, authors, managers, etc. Details, personal details of all those dignitaries is required to be given. Very small change. Schedule IA again, as you all know that in case of trust, up to 15% is allowed to be kept as reserve. So if, if, if you're receiving 100 rupees donation and you're applying only 85 rupees, that is fine. That 15% will not be considered as your income, it's fine. However, if you wish that, no, I want to reserve more, for the future years, you are not expending 85, you are expending only 70 and you are reserving 30 rupees. Then in that case, it is allowed subject to certain specific conditions. Now, say for example, you are not complying that particular condition in the forthcoming year. So there is a condition of, you know, five years, one year, etc. things are there. In the future years, you are required to expend it, but you are not expended, expending it or you are expending it in a manner which is not allowed, otherwise allowed by the act. So there is a violation. Now, up to last year, there was no such requirement wherein you are, you are required to report your past history about your accumulation and the non -viol, uh, you know, violation of such kind of accumulation. There was no such schedule. In this year's schedule, they have provided that last five years, ka aapne jitna pe accumulate kiya hai, uska kaun sa figure hai. And corresponding to that, you have to also report that in which all year you have kind of violated that accumulation ka jo conditions hai by virtue of which it was already taxed in any previous year. So this is just, I can say, means of gathering the data, okay, accumulating the data, ki bhai, itna accumulation hai, kabhi itna apply kiya. because at the time of assessment, it becomes very difficult to categorize everything. Kabhi konsa aya, kabhi apply kiya, kabhi nahi kiya, kabhi violation hua. So if this is in the idea schedule itself, I think it would be very simplified at the time of assessment. So again, a new reporting in schedule I. Schedule balance sheet, and that is schedule BS. Again, a new breakup has been given. In this breakup, regarding the corpus donation, uh, sorry, regarding the balance sheet application of the fund, that is on asset side, you have to divide it into two parts. So obviously your entire asset side is freeze. After that, you have to categorize it. So out of the total application, what are the applications which are made under section 11, subsection 5, that is a specified mode of investment. And what are the applications which are made Otherwise, then no. Okay, so this is also one of the reporting criteria. Uh, proper accountancy can only help in reporting all these kind of requirements which are now required under trust. Okay, so out of the total balance sheet, child, you have to bifurcate into two parts. Make sure that your clients does it before time because it may take a lot of time to categorize, especially in case of huge trust. Schedule R, again, a new schedule. It's a reconciliation given between the corpus donation which is reported in your balance sheet and the corpus which is reported in Schedule J. Schedule J is a specific schedule for reporting all kind of investment uh, which are made under 11.5 relating to your corpus. So out of corpus, whatever investment you are made in 11.5 specified modes, you have to report it in that particular schedule. Now this particular schedule R, you have to fill in and you have to reconcile the difference between the corpus which is reporting in Schedule BF and the corpus which is coming in the schedule J. Okay, so the reconciliation will be on account, generally on account of this purchase of fixed asset and the depreciation thereof. Because in schedule J, that may not be included or in balance sheet, you will have that particular line item of your fixed asset. So they, they have also given a residuary line wherein for any other item which is not covered by these two categories can also be filled up. But again, this reconciliation is there. It may be time consuming if the accounts are not properly maintained. So again, it may consume a lot of time by finding the return of income. So to my uh, understanding, this where the, I can say few relevant changes in the form per se, I'll say the changes which are made in the form itself. 
Now we'll be considering certain amendments which are relevant while filing the return of income for assessment year 2023-24. This amendment pertains to Finance Year uh, Finance Act 23 as well as Finance Act 22. I have covered certain important uh, amendments. Very first one is made in Finance Act 2023 itself, which is even applicable for assessment year 23-24. That is Agnipath scheme, contribution to the Agnipath scheme. Now, what is this scheme? This, we all know that this scheme has been brought up to encourage the you know, youth of India to go into the armed forces. Now, in this scheme, they have stated that we will open a fund that is Agnipath uh, scheme or Agnipath fund, Agnipath corpus fund. In this particular fund, the eligible person who has enrolled for that particular category, okay, he has the option to put in some amount out of his own pocket. Plus, the government will also contribute in that particular fund. That is nothing but the stipend or I can say the payment which the government will give to that particular individual who is, you know, serving the country. So now, actually, as per section 17, subsection 1, clause 9, the contribution which is made by the government to these funds is considered as salary. Okay, it is considered as salary. It is your salary. It is covered within the definition of salary. Simple. However, section 80 double CH provides that whatever contribution is made by the central government to this account will be allowed as deduction. Okay, so this particular deduction was introduced in this Finance Act 2023 itself. Now, again, there are two categories. Say, suppose if the individual has opted for the scheme of 115 EAC, so if you are into new regime, if you are into new regime, then under this particular section, you will get deduction only to the extent of the amount which is contributed by the central government. So, central government has given you salary, diya hai, okay, the stipend, diya hai, that will be uh, allowed as deduction, that, will, that is required to be reduced from your taxable income in the new scheme. However, in the old scheme, if you are sticking to your old scheme, then whatever voluntary contribution that particular individual makes to that particular fund, that is also allowed as deduction as well as the amount of contribution which is made by the central government to that particular account of that particular individual, both will be allowed as deduction. So this is also one line of item which needs to be considered when you are, uh, you know, filing return of income for such kind of individuals. That is a section 80 CCH. Section 68 as such not relevant for written filing, but I will say from the stage of written filing itself, you need to consider that in the last budget, we had this amendment in section 68, which says that if you are borrowing any unsecured loans, then it will be deemed to be not satisfactorily explained unless that lender also explains the source of that particular funds. So now whenever you're reporting anything, in your idea as unsecured loans or borrowings, make sure that such details will be triggered in section 16 also. You have, at least at this stage itself, because assessment comes after one year, two year, three year, then what time pay confirmation nahi milta, ye nahi milta, wo nahi milta, assessment hota hai. So better that in this year itself, before filing return of income, you make sure that you take all these details from the lender so that you don't face any issue when it comes to the assessment stage. Section 68, nothing to do with ITR, but is relevant for filing ITR. Then again, a small change in dividend and bonus stripping, uh, I can say, amendments. This, this was also made last year. Section 94, subsection 7 deals with dividend stripping. So in this case, if you are acquiring any shares or securities, okay, before a record date, before the dividend is declared, before a specified period, three months, etc. And after that record date, you're immediately sending it off when the price goes down and you incur losses. In such cases, the loss which you have incurred will not be allowed. This is the concept of dividend stripping. That was applicable to shares as well as units, that is mutual fund as well as. There is similar concept of bonus stripping, that is under subsection 8 of section 94. It also says that before the record date, if you're acquiring bonus shares, and after the record date, you're selling it off and you're incurring losses then that losses will not be allowed. However, this subsection 8 was applicable only for units, that is your mutual fund units, it was not applicable to shares. Now, by Finance Act 2022, they have made it applicable even 
for all kinds of shares and securities. So in this year's idea, whenever you're filing a return of income, if you're incurring any short-term loss, which is you know near about being covered by this particular provision, then that loss will not be allowed legally. I don't know in how assess at assessment stage definitely you can take your stand, but as per the law, it will not be allowed. So this bonus tripping transaction are, is also now made available for. It is also made applicable even in respect of rates, invits, and AIMs. So earlier it was not applicable to these categories. Now because of the substantial investments and uh, transaction, these categories of investment also, it has been made even applicable to rates, invits, and AIMs. So this is also one of the provisions which needs to be considered by filing the idea. Section 43B. That is deduction will be allowed only when you make the actual payment of that particular line items which are given uh, specified transactions which are given under section 43b. Section 43b has three clauses which deals only with interest from loans and borrowings. So if you have borrowed interest from any public financial institution, any banks, even a cooperating bank, any PFCs, that interest expenditure will be allowed as deduction only if you actually pay that. And, uh, and it will not be allowed on your actual basis. In certain, in certain cases, what was happening was that people used to convert that entire loan or entire accumulated interest, which was due, into debentures. So that was converted from loan to debentures, including that accumulated interest. So there were decisions of Honorable tribunals, wherein this kind of conversion was treated as discharging of actual liability of interest. And hence, it was treated that whenever the loan is converted into debenture, it is a chargement of the interest liability. And accordingly, such kind of conversion is also covered by, uh, sorry, it is not covered by Section 43B. It will be considered as if you paid that interest. And hence, that deduction was allowed. In the last budget, they have they have made an amendment in explanation to all of these clauses. In this explanation, they have stated that any kind of conversion from loan to debenture or from borrowing to debenture, including the interest allowance, will not be considered as dischargement of that particular liability. It will still continue as if you have not discharged that liability. So that is also one thing. Now practical issue will come. Then at what point of time I'll get the deduction? That is a very big question. Because once you say, suppose you convert it into debenture, it is possible that after eight years, the debenture is getting redeemed. At that point of time, maybe you can claim. But up to that period, you will have to wait. So that is also one of the points which needs to be considered by filing the idea, especially when there's a conversion of loan into debentures. Tax relief in case of certain categories of individuals whose dependents are, I can say, specially held. I'll just give this particular provision with the help of an example. Section 80DD provides for a straight standard deduction of 75,000 rupees in cases of those SSEs or parents or guardians whose dependents are specially able. In such cases, they get 75,000 direct deduction. The conditions where they, ex they expend something for their medical treatment or for future maintenance. Say, for example, there is a father who is now aged. He knows that my son is specially able. He will not be able to look after himself. So what he is doing is throughout his lifetime, he is contributing some amount to that particular fund, which is operated by LIC or other insurance companies. And this LIC and other insurance company make sure that after the death of that particular father, this particular fund will be used for the maintenance of the particular specially able children. Now, up to last year, there was only one category, which is that only about the death of that particular parent or that guardian, this amount will be allowed, you know, to be paid to this particular uh, individual for their maintenance, which is allowed as deduction, only that category. So, genuine hardship were faced in categories where the parents were senior citizen, they were no longer contributing to that fund. But now they themselves are in need of the money to take care of the child. Fund is there, but they are alive and deduction will not be allowed because they are alive. It was that scenario. 
So in order to curb this kind of uh, hardship, they have introduced this new provision saying that once that parent attains the age of 80 and he has stopped contributing to that fund, then also that particular parent will get reduction of that 75,000 rupees, even if he is alive, he or she is alive, and they are not contributing to that particular fund. So this is the beneficial provision. Okay. So earlier it was not allowed. Now it is allowed, which is still needs to be taken into consideration. Section 79A, again, this was even discussed in last year's presentation. I'm covering it again because this is also one of the important things which needs to be considered when it comes to setting and uh, setting up of losses. So if I take a practical example of this particular scenario, section 115BE provides for taxation in case where income is added in the section 68 to 69D, that is special category of incomes. This particular section 115 BBE also provides at the end that you will not get deduction. You will not get any kind of setting off of losses against this kind of income, which is added to your total income. You will not get any kind of setting off or you cannot set up any current year losses also to that. So that was fine. That was clear. However, there were scenarios where say, for example, I am a jeweler. I have a jewelry shop. There is a surge in my premises. In that surge, I voluntarily disclose that I have unaccounted Bullions, I have unaccounted stock of say rupees one crore. This is my unaccounted stock. And this is a business stock. Now, in assessment time, the assessing officer used to add this particular bullions into 69A or 69A, whatever is applicable. This was made the addition and it was taxed as by BPE. Now, at this tribunal stage or at the high court stage, the courts used to help that once the assessing is saying that it is from business sources. And he has that proof that yes, it is his business. Then you cannot tax it under section 68 to 69D. You have to tax it as your business income under section 28. You cannot tax it under 115 BBE. So that was removed from section 68 or 69D up to 69D. And then it was taxed under section 28. Now, at this point of time, what used to happen? Addition Hoga under section 28, that is fine. But under section 28, that is under PGBP, it is possible. That that assessee has incurred losses in the current year or he has brought forward losses. So now what was happening was people were using this brought forward losses or current year losses to set off that income which is added, that undisclosed income which was added to their income. So this was the kind of loophole in the law which you know allowed the mischievous taxpayer to set off their undisclosed income against their business profits. You know, plug in this particular loophole, this particular section was provided, uh, introduced, section 79A, which says that once it is an undisclosed income, which is pursuant to any kind of search or seizure or requisition, at that point of time it is undisclosed, then you cannot set off your existing losses or existing business loss, any kind of loss, not for losses, again, this kind of income. Okay, so earlier these tactics were used. Okay, to report in the ITR, but now you cannot use this tactic in the IP uh, in the ITR because of section 79A. Again, section 14A, a dispute of every year's assessment. They have made it clear now that even if you are not earning any kind of exempt income, but if you are incurred any expenditure in earning that exempt income for earning that exempt income, then it will be disallowed under section 14A. Okay, so they have made a clarification, a clar clarificatory amendment. So in this year idea, also you will have to take care in case of client where earlier used to take a stand that because there is no exempt income by virtue of various decisions of uh, you know tribunals and high court, people were taking stand that no, because there is no exempt income, there will be no disallowance under 14A. But now onwards, you have to see to it in the in your ITR. Even if there is no exempt income, still if there is an expenditure is incurred then you will have to disallow that amount of expenditure. There is a Delhi High Court uh, decision on this, I think in the year 2022, September 22, which says that this particular amendment is not retrospective. So I'm not talking about this year's IDR, but just in case Agi assessment data for any future, uh, previous year IDR, because this amendment is introduced in the way of a clarification. So they will say because it's a clarificatory amendment, it will apply retrospectively. Delhi I could have said no, it cannot, it cannot apply retrospectively, even though the wordings are like clarificatory in nature. Taxability of interest on provident fund. This was even uh, discussed in last year's ITR. 
again uh, because it's a new thing i have kept it as it is in this year's idr also uh, this slide also so generally earlier we had that impression that any kind of interest which is earned out of any provident fund it will be exempt under section uh, 10 clause 11 or clause 12 depending on the category of the particular fund employee provident fund or the public provident fund now from last year they have categorized that it, the interest will be exempt only up to specified limit of investment. If you are investing more than that particular specified limit, then whatever in, interest you earn on that incremental investment will be taxed under IFRS. So they have categorized this aspect into two parts. One is a fund where even the employer is contributing and other is the fund where only individual or the assessor is con contributing. So in case where employer is also contributing in such cases, along with the employee, the interest, which is earned up to rupees 250,000 from the employee's contribution will be continue to remain exempt. However, if the employee is, you know, investing more than 2.5 lakh, then on the in incremental amount, whatever interest is accrued, that in interest will be taxable under IFRS. Same way, say, suppose there is no contribution made by the employer. Only I am contributing by myself, be it a PPF or be it any other fund, recognized fund. In that case, the limit is 5 lakh. So up to 5 lakh, if I am investing and in whatever interest I am earning, it will be exempt. But if I am investing 6 lakh, then on that 1 lakh, incre incremental 1 lakh, whatever in interest income I learn, that will be subjected to tax under IFRS. So that is required to be considered while filing return of income. There is a rule which is given, rule 90, where in this particular Competition mechanism is given a very simple competition mechanism. Okay, wherein you have to bifurcate. Obviously, this amendment was introduced from 1st of April 21. So, balance in that fund up to 31st of March 21 will always continue to remain under the exempt category. So, uske upa, 31st of March 21, balance upa, jo bhi interest aara hai, that will continue to remain exempt for life. Long. Uske upa, kabhi bhi koi tax nahi hai. It is only after 1st of uh, April 21. You have to bifurcate in these two categories, simple categories, mathematical formula, which is given here. Yes. Okay. So last year I provided for the interest because Correct. now what happened is the interest has to. Okay. How do we this so there are various practical scenarios where, where actually it happens that the deductor is deducting the TDS in the subsequent year, whereas we are offering the income in this year. If I talk legally, section 199, section 198, section 205, it clearly says that once you offer the income to tax, you should get the deduction of that uh, amount, which is, you know, credited to uh, deducted by the deductor. According to me, if I am filing return of income, if I am correctly filing my return of income, I will have to offer it in this year only, not in the subsequent year. This is a practical situation where at least what I will do is in the TDS column, I will definitely enter the PAN, I mean, enter the deduction details. Definitely it will lead to disallowance. But according to me, this is the correct way of filing. There are several decisions which says that there, there is, as per section 205, there is bar on the direct recovery from the SSC. You cannot recover any amount once it is deducted. Okay, so once the fund itself says that we are deducted in subsequent years, okay, you cannot recover it from the SSC. But definitely, yes, there's a practical issue where the SSC will have to suffer in the first year. Like we used to do in this, you know, FD accrual system. You can you can come up with a practical way. Correct. I got your point. <laughs> Absolutely. It is new for them. PM department generally was passive up to now. Now they have, you, they have to come into this active mode. 
to comply with all these requirements. So is that correct, Mr. Gobi? PSRI is not. According to me, legal it is not correct definitely because once you are, you have to offer it. Absolutely. Practically, you have to go by that. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a practical issue. Man. I think they should come up with this issue because if the institution itself is not complying with the requirement which they are doing i think they should improvise on this aspect they should improvise in certain absolutely way. absolutely a representation ought to be made yeah practical difficulties will always be there now amendment in section 1020 that is relating to uh, unit link insurance policies uh, 1010d provides for exemption when you receive any amount from the insurance company, okay. However, there are exceptions. So, clause D of that particular ex, uh, ex, uh, this exemption section that is standard D provides that if at all the premium which is paid for any of these policies exceed ten percent of the uh, sum assured, then for such kind of policies, if you receive any amount in future, that amount will be taxable. That will not be exempt. So, this was I can say a percentage or ad valorem exemption or against the threshold limit which they have provided the 10 percent of the sum assured now in the last budget they have come up with another threshold limit that is a monetary direct threshold limit especially only with respect to ulips that is unit link insurance policy as per this section it says that any kind of policy which is issued after first of february 21 if your annual premium for that kind of ulip is exceeding rupees 2.5 lakh then in that case, agar future mein bhi us particular policy se paisa aata hai, you receive any amount that will be taxed. It will not be exempt. Same way, it also provides that in case of multiple ULIPs, what you can do is you can claim the exemption in respect of only those policies where the premium is up to rupees 2.5x. So for example, I have eight policies, ULIP policy, eight policies. All for all of them, I am paying different amount as my premium. Now, this particular section says that aggregate of them is exceeding 2.5 lakh. So, as such, the first impression is whatever amount you will receive will not, will be taxable. But this particular proviso provides that what you can do is you can cherry pick those policies which premium is you know aggregating up to 2.5. Uthre policies may say jobi apko paisa aega that we will continue to be exempt. But uske alawa jo policies hai. It will be uh, taxable. So, yes, and whatever income which is taxable, it will be taxed under section 45, uh, subsection 1b, that is specifically provided only for ULIPS uh, in the last project, section 45, subsection 1b, that is you have to keep uh, treated as your capital gains. Now, these were the slides which we had discussed were relevant, you know, amendments which may be taken into consideration when filing the ITRs. Now we'll be revising certain schedules which are already there in the ITR, but you know, there are specific instruction given in the instruction module, which people, you know, may not have gone through. Okay. Yes, sir, please. Sir, just a minute. I think I have missed out from my slide. The premium which you have paid will be allowed as cost of deduction. Yes. Indexation, uh, indexation, yes, uh, because it is not covered by the proviso. I will get back to you, ma'am. According to me, it is not covered by the exception. So indexation should ideally apply. Ideally apply. Because in 48, I don't think so there is any amendment. If it's, this is to, I'm, I'm not having the exact knowledge of this. I'll get back to you. Sorry, ma'am. Can you please repeat? Yes. Yes. Again, uh, this is again, the same thing, which is a question mark because even earlier, this question was there, whether it is IFOS or capital gain. Now, by virtue of this 1B, 
they have specifically provided that ulips will be considered as capital gain but that is unit link now in case of regular policies or in case of you at least for ulips which are not exempted i think it should go under capital gains indirectly obliquely i can say then i think you will have to you will have to choose whether you to go for any specific sector that is not there will be definitely but there is a case specific case specific discussion i think okay so i think whatever is beneficial to the assessee okay uh, so premium for which i pay only for what Yes. 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 Correct. Correct. In my opinion, in absence of any specific provision, it is open for the SSC whatever is beneficial to them. But then, in that case, it will be the onus will be on you. How will you say that it is a capital asset? So all those conditions are still there. You have to comply with the definition of transfer. You have to comply with the definition of capital asset. Whether you call your policies are asset, if yes, then yes, you can go with the capital gains. Yes. So ulips. This is only for ulips. First February two thousand twenty one के बाद जो issue होगा only to that particular provision is will apply. Prior to that, this provision is no longer in existence. So it will go as per the uh, sum assured वाला जो category था ten percent of the sum assured. It will go by that according to me. Only if your premium pays is up to ten percent of the sum assured. Now coming to certain relevant schedule that is schedule F A that is foreign asset schedule very important schedule. well the residents are required to report the details of their foreign uh, investment or foreign asset held by them so in this particular table you are required to report the depository account custodian accounts equity and debt interest also foreign cash value insurance contract again uh, immobile properties capital asset etc etc now there are instruction which are given in the instruction module which i have reproduced over here we'll just go through that if you are resident in india you are required to furnish this detail of any foreign asset So for resident, it is mandatory. If you are having any foreign asset, you have to report in this schedule. Resident can be, you know, the ownership can be either beneficial ownership or even you are a beneficiary or legal ownership. Any of these three are there, you will have to require to report in the schedule F A. It is not only that if you are legal owner, then you are required to report. No, even if you are a beneficial owner or a beneficiary, then also you are required to report it. This schedule need not be filled up if you are not only a resident or a non-resident. So for R and N O R and for N R, that is non-resident, this schedule will not apply. Details are required to be reported even if the specified asset is held even for a single day. So, one day for you. If you have that specified list item, if any other foreign asset has come, then definitely you are required to report it being in this particular schedule. If you have held foreign asset during the previous year, which have been duly reported in Schedule F, even then you are required to report it again in Schedule A also. We'll come to Schedule A that is applicable only where the total income is exceeding rupees fifty lakhs. so once you reported in fa that is fa is only for foreign asset reporting when reporting while reporting in al also you will have to report that again okay that particular asset again in asset liability schedule so we will come to that also again and the rate of conversion naturally because the currency will be different it has to be the ttbr of the foreign currency as on well the exchange rate adopted by the sbi so this is given in the instruction module then period of reporting very important a confusion of every year in this particular schedule they have specifically provided it that you have to report the items or the asset items based on the calendar year so for this year in this year's itr our year start from 1st of april 31st of march that is 1st of april 22 31st of march 23 however in this particular schedule you will have to report all those asset which are covered from 1st of january 2022 to 31st of december 2022 so even q4 of this assessment year will not come into picture in this particular schedule okay so please take care of that so from any asset which is you know acquired after you know on or after 1st of january 2023 up to 31st of march 2023 will not be required to be reported in this particular schedule details of directorship again this is a new line item this was there but there is certain additional disclosure which is given in this particular line item so details of your directorship whether you are a director in any company or not you have to report it if once you select yes you are a director you will be uh, you know that window will be enabled wherein you are required to report the name of the company 
then type of the company whether is a domestic company or a foreign company then even the pair of the company okay then whether the company is listed or unlisted company and obviously a din number also there is a instruction which is given in the instruction module regarding this it says that furnish pan and din is not mandatory in case of a foreign company so if you are a director of a foreign company then obviously pan or din to nahi hoga okay uh, with respect to that foreign company however if the pan pan is allotted then that is required to be reported if a non resident tax payer is a director only of a foreign company and that foreign company has nothing to do with india that foreign company uh, is not earning any kind of in income in india then in that case the non resident who may be a director in a foreign country a uh, foreign company that particular reporting is not required uh, required by that particular non resident so he will have to select no he is not a director of any company so he has to give the answer in uh, negative a non resident tax payer who is director in domestic company and in a foreign company but that foreign company is not having any income in india then his answer should be yes i am a director and he is required to give, give details only with respect to the domestic company in which he is a director same way a resident tax payer is required to disclose all the details of the direct uh, directorship including you know foreign company or domestic robust company obviously in, even in case of foreign company he will have to report that is a director is a resident but is a director in a foreign company so this reporting requirements are generally missed out which is required to be taken into consideration details of unlisted shares again uh, very important because nowadays there has been quite you know uh, i can say enhancement or uh, frequency of transaction in you know contributing or investing in a unlisted company like startup etc this uh, reporting requirement is very important you have to report whether you have invested in any unlisted company or not if you say yes then you'll ask you'll be asked certain details like the name of the company type of the company pan number what is the opening quantity of shares what are the cost of acquisition of the shares okay what uh, shares acquired during the year what is the In, during the year water additional acquire uh, acquiring is there and what is the uh, amount which you have transferred or you know sold on certain instruction which are again given in this uh, instruction module for this particular reporting if you have held shares of a company during the previous year which are listed on a recognized stock exchange outside india then such shares will not be required to be reported in this schedule so foreign country may agar koi listed shares hai aapka No, recognized stock exchange in the foreign country, then that shares will not be required to be listed in the, uh, you know reproducing this particular schedule. In case of the pan of a delisted company cannot be obtained, you may enter this particular pan. So there will be a delisted company where you are holding the shares of such delisted company. Pan will be compulsory, but because you are not having the pan, you can write this particular number. In case unlisted equity shares are acquired or transferred by way of gift. Bill, amalgamation, merger, demerger, or bonus issue. In such cases, you may enter zero or appropriate value as the cost of acquisition. Naturally, if you are receiving any unlisted share as a gift or any other, you know, by way of a corporate action, etc., then in that case, the cost of acquisition will be zero. And so, in this schedule, it is mandatory to write COA, that is cost of acquisition, where where you can write zero or the appropriate cost, whatever it may be. now please note that the details of the unlisted uh, shares held during the year are required only for the purpose of reporting the quantitative details entered in this column are not relevant for for the purpose of computation of tax liability so yahan pe you will be asked the opening balance during their acquisition during their sale and the closing balance quantity as well as the amount so this particular schedule is no overlap with the income computation okay so you need to uh, uh, remember that while reporting in your cg you will have to make a separate disclosure okay so that is the instruction which they have given now again very important even in case where you held unlisted equity shares as stock in trade during the previous year you are required to report the same in this clause so say suppose you are dealing in shares and you are having some unlisted shares as your stock in trade then also in this particular schedule that is investment in unlisted companies you are required to mandatorily provide that details of that unlisted shares you are not required to provide details of cooperative banks you know shares or securities held of a cooperative bank or cooperative society in this particular schedule now in case of itr 6 there is a new schedule which was introduced last year that is investment in unincorporated entity unincorporated entity even the companies are now investing in other companies which are unlisted so this particular uh, schedule was there only for individuals and other categories but not for companies 
So in the last year, they had introduced this schedule IF, wherein these details which are required even in case of individuals are asked again in case of the companies. I'm just running through this slide. One more two A. We have been filling up since last three years. Yes, please. FNO transaction in the sense. Uh, Ma'am, can we take it at the end? Okay. Fair enough. I'm running to schedule AL in the press release because that is relevant. Uh, I mean, applicable since last three years. We all know all this schedule one one two A. Schedule AL again, asset liability schedule. It is it is mandatory to report in the schedule if your income is exceeding rupees fifty lakhs. Uh, individual also in case of if in case you are individual and you are filing ITR three, that is you are filing your balance sheet. Then once you have reported certain assets in your balance sheet or in liability, certain liabilities in your balance sheet, that part will not be required to be reported in AL. In AL, you have to report other than those which are covered by schedule A, uh, uh, this schedule BS. Asset and liabilities at the end of the year are required to be reported. If you are a non-resident or resident but not ordinary resident, only the details of asset located in India are required to be reported. So for non-resident and for R but NOR, okay, only the asset which are in India, even in Schedule AL, is required to be reported. Okay, so this is uh, what they have provided. Again, if you have uh, held foreign asset during the previous year, which have been duly reported in FA, in case of residents. Even if it, you are reporting in FA, you are still have to report again in AL in case of residents. Yes, uh, cost of acquisition they have given that actual cost price you have to consider called reporting in this schedule AL. You have to report the cost price and not the market value. So I have seen certain return of income that in schedule AL, when they disclose the asset and liability, they write the value of market value of the shares on 30, 31st of March. No, please don't do that. It will end up, you know, the officer claiming that you had acquired, you know, you had this amount as cost of acquisition. So please report the cost of acquisition, which is the actual cost of acquisition in this particular schedule. In case of company also, this schedule is there, schedule AL again, AL1, that is required to be filled by unlisted companies only. For listed company, this schedule is not applicable. Even if the asset are held in stock in trade, still they are required to report in this particular schedule. And wherein they have to report the purpose, the purpose is as stock in trade. So there will be no immobile property or there will be current assets wherein there will be a drop down. And in the lockdown, you have to select that it is for the purpose of a stock in trade. But you have to report even the stock in trade in this particular schedule. Now, again, a legal issue, dividend classification of dividend. In last year's ITR, they have made this change only in the ITR, not in the Act, nowhere in the Act. In the Act, there is already a provision, section 56, 2, clause 1, which says that dividend income will be taxable under the head of income from other sources. However, there is certain decision which says that when that particular assessee is itself in the business of dealing in shares, the dividend income cannot be considered as IFOS, it has to be considered as business income. There are decisions contrary as well as for, uh, I mean, for and against the SSE. But yes, definitely the people used to take a particular stand based on their own criteria. However, in last year's ITR, what they have done is under Schedule BP, they have introduced this line item saying that whatever dividend income you earn, you have to compulsorily exclude it from Schedule BP and it will go into IFOS. So they are mandatorily requiring you to report your dividend income only under IFOS. Whereas there are decisions which supports the view that yes, dividend, dividend income can also be considered as business income. So this is one of the things which was there even the last year, even in this year, you have to take care what stand you have been consistently following in your clients. So this is that schedule wherein the dividend income will be excluded. Now, when you're reporting dividend income in IFOS, you have to make sure that you report the point of accrual of the dividend also in that particular breakup schedule because it has impact on 234C. So 234C gives an exemption, I think it's a relief in case of dividend income, capital gains and certain other income, okay, where you cannot predict that I have to pay for the whole year. So 234C gives relief to that extent that once if you are earning dividend income and you are, if you are paying your advance tax after the receipt of that dividend income in the subsequent quarter, we will not burden you with the two interest under section 234C for the entire year. However, this is possible only if you report it properly in that particular breakup schedule, which is given in scheduled IFOS. If you don't give this breakup properly, CPC will make calculate on the entire, in the entire, you know, considering that this income was estimatable for the entire year and accordingly they will calculate what was the advanced tax liability and 234C may be applicable. 
generally what happens is generally practically what people do is they just enter the entire dividend amount in the last one so that there is no question of i know uh, levy of interest under 234c this is the practical way people are following but if i talk about the legal way this should be the way and you should report it properly so that cpc will reconcile this quarter wise details with the advance pay uh, advance tax details and accordingly 234c relief will be given absolutely but i think for that uh, uh, there is their schedule is there ah yes obviously because of the uh, you know positive time and it is very difficult to categorize unless you have a very good software wherein you uh, everything is coming ready to hand now uh, one more important amendment that is section 57 that is deduction in respect of the uh, i can say interest income for the dividend which you have earned this particular amendment was made even in the last in, in the last year it says that against your dividend income which you are reporting under ifs if you are reporting then in that case only income expenditure will be allowed and no other expenditure will be allowed so clause d provides that whatever expenditure you are incurring exclusively for earning you know that particular income so then that particular expenditure will be allowed as deduction under section 57 clause 3 this revise says that in case of dividend income you can only claim income interest expense and no other expense and that too restricted to 20% of the dividend income now there will be some legal issues over here also according to me like we have some issues in 3613 that is own for borrowed fund what if i have invested you know 5 lakhs on my own fund 5 lakhs on my borrowed fund and i have invested 10 lakhs in a shares i have earned 1 lakh rupees as a dividend income i am offering it 1 lakh rupees in ifos however assessing officer will say 20% of the dividend income that comes through as such 20000 but officer may say that aapne market se jo borrowing liya hai wo that is only to the extent of 5 lakh so correspondingly only 50000 will be available for you to claim deduction and 20% of 50000 should be taken and not entire on not on, not on entire 1 lakh rupees the same issue which we have in 3613 okay so this is also one of the legal issue which may, uh, needs to be addressed please note that this 20% of the dividend income is the restricted final amount even if you are incurred more than expenditure more than that it will not be allowed to be carry forward no okay 20% is the final amount there is one legal point i have covered in this particular aspect with respect to whether to treat it as a ifos or not dividend income a very good case law is there i have covered it in the later slides we'll discuss on that now again uh, a very small note which was given in the itr uh, instruction module with respect to maintenance of books of account so you have to select whether you are required to maintain books of account under section 44 aa or not so in case if you are engaged in a specified profession like legal medical engineering architecture accountancy etc it is mandatory for you to maintain books of account irrespective of your income whereas in case of non specified professional or business it is based on your income limit or the turnover limit which is given over here so you have to specify whether yes or no whether you are required to maintain or not once you say that yes you are required to maintain there is a note given in the instruction module which says that please make sure that if at all in your 3cd if there is any amount which is reported as not routed through pnl there is a line item in form 3cd wherein the auditor is required to check whether there is any income which is not routed through pnl but it is includeable in total income of the uh, ssc okay so that income is required to be reported in 3cd and the auditor is required to verify that so if that amount is there is reported in 3cd make sure that even in the return of income you fill that schedule you fill that line item which is also given in schedule oi so many a times oi is left you know like blank so make sure that you fill that figure in oi if you not fill if you don't fill up that figure in schedule oi the cpc will order automatically you know take that figure from 3cd and add it to your total income it is possible that some some of the people are reporting that directly in schedule bp any other income category directly they are adding it to that but they are not uh, disclosing it in schedule oi they are including total income but it is through bp schedule and not through oi schedule so this instruction says that please route it through oi schedule so that there will not be any mismatch by the cpc yes please sir correct Okay, sir. Please. Sir, if I read 
bare provisions of section 44 ADA or section 44 AD. It's it nowhere says that you are not required to maintain books of order. It nowhere says they are not required. It says that once you violate these conditions, you are required to maintain books of order. It's the otherwise. There is a difference between both of these statements. So first of all, if I go by the bare provision, there is no provision in 44 ADA which says. That you have to maintain the books of account, or you you are not required to maintain the books of account. But if you are falling under 44 ADA, which is which means you are even covered by Section 44 AA, which requires you to maintain books of account. So in that case, it will not be regular books of account, but at least some books of account which will help the assessing officer to assess your income. So that is what is provided in Section 44 AA. So sir, your estimation will be based on something. Your bank statement, or some cash book, or some register—that is nothing but your books of account. Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. That is also altogether a different hectic. We'll cover it. We'll cover it. So, sir, if you refer to security website or the e-filing website, there is a FAQ on section forty-four ADA and section forty-four AD FAQs. Only in that FAQs they have directly stated that you are not required to maintain books of accounts if you are opting for 44 AD. In the app, section 44 AD nowhere says that you are not required to maintain books of account. No. So this is some legal reading which is required. You no, know, but yes, FAQ says that fine, you are not required to maintain books of account. 44 AD indirectly says that if you violate provisions of section 44 AD. Then now you are required to maintain books of account, which obliquely means earlier you are not required to maintain books of account. Yes, sir, you are required to maintain at least bare category of books or any record which will help you yourself in determining the income. Sir, that is what I am telling you that your bank statement or your any loose paper wherein you re record your receipts. You have to compute your total income. That is to be done by you, not by the officer. So, for whenever you are computing your total income, you must have something on your hand which can substantiate that yes, this is my income. It is, sir. It is, but obliquely, yes. It is. So, no, no. You have to say no, no, sir. Whether you are so, my question over here is whether you are liable to maintain books of account or no. Yes or no. Correct. Then your re reporting should be in Schedule Forty Four ADA and not in the regular balance sheet. There is a separate line item for. Huh? No, no, sir. See. Once you opt for forty-four ADA, yeah. first of all, here you will say no. Yeah. In forty-four ADA, you have a separate four-liner balance sheet. Again, I will go to CBDT FAQs, which says that if you are opting for forty-four AD or forty-four ADA, you are not required to maintain books. So this is regarding reporting schedule Y. Now again, a very favorite question, which is always asked regarding, you know, this is the most second favorite FAQ. I like get frequently asked question that if I have seen my profit from eight percent to less, then will my tax audit be applicable? Or not? Even today, every year this question comes up. I'll just I'll just brief you up with this since we have a very less time left. Up to AY sixteen seventeen, up to AY sixteen seventeen, there was a specific provision under section forty four eighty, which stated that once you declare your profit below that specified profit rate, you are required to maintain books of account and get them audited. So specific direct express provision, up to AY sixteen seventeen. In that case, if at all you had your income above the basic exemption limit and you declare your profit less than eight percent. In that year, only in that year, you are required to maintain books of account and get your account updated up to AY sixteen seventeen. From AY seventeen eighteen, the new provisions came into force, section forty four AD, subsection four. Subsection four says that if in any year you have opted for 
44 AD, and subsequently, after opting in any of the next five years, you are not opting for 44 AD. Then, in that case, you are required to maintain books of account and get them audited for the subsequent five years. You are not eligible to again re-enter that scheme of presumptive taxation for the subsequent five years. Now, the question is. There is no requirement given under this particular section, or even under section 44 A B, or even under section uh, subsection 5 of section 44 A D, which says that my profit is less than the specified uh, you know profit rate, and hence I have to get it audited. No, you have to get it audited only when you violate that particular provision saying that आपने पहले कभी opt किया था 44 A D, or in the next five years you are opting out. Once you opt out. From that year and for the next five years, you are required to maintain books of account and get them audited. This is the criteria, according to me in my reading. There is no such criteria right now which says that just because my profit is less than eight percent, I have to get it audited. No. So can there be a can there be a scenario where my profit is less than eight percent, still I am not required to conduct tax audit? Yes, there can be many scenarios. I'll come to that. The very first scenario is this is my first year of business. Very first year of business, I am maintaining my books of account. My turnover is say rupees eighty lakh, not exceeding one crore, eighty lakh rupees. My profit is only one thousand rupees, only one thousand rupees. That is below the specified rate of six percent or eight percent. Now, in this case, there is no requirement to conduct audit because there is no violation of subsection four of section forty four eighty. Subsection four of forty four eighty कभी apply होता है? तभी apply होता है जब भी आपने पहले किसी साल में opt in किया हो और उसके बाद वाले साल में आप opt out कर रहे हो. या तो मेरा पहला ही साल है नो क्वेश्चन ऑफ़ ऑप्टिंग आउट आई एम नॉट ऑप्टेड इन एट एनी पॉइंट ऑफ़ टाइम एंड हेंस इन माय ओपिनियन पर्सनल ओपिनियन इन दिस सिनेरियो इवन इफ द प्रॉफिट रेट इज लेस देन 8 परसेंट देर इज नो रिक्वायरमेंट फॉर कंडक्टिंग टैक्स सेम वे देर कैन बी सेकंड सिनेरियो वेयर आई हैव बीन कैरीड ऑन माय बिजनेस फॉर लॉन्ग इयर्स एवरी ईयर आई हैव बीन मेंटेनिंग माय बुक्स ऑफ अकाउंट एंड आई एम गेटिंग इट ऑडिटेड इन दिस ईयर इट्स द फर्स्ट ईयर वेयर माय यू नो टर्नओवर इज लेस देन 1 करोड़ और इस साल मेरा मूड नहीं है कुछ भी ऑडिट करवाने का Um, I I don't want to you know maintain books of account anything. I want to go for presumptive taxation. In this year, my profit is less than eight percent or six percent, whatever it is. Still, I am not required to conduct audit because in any of the earlier years I had not obtained opted in for forty four eighty. Forty four eighty four or subsection forty four forty four eighty five will come into picture only when you have opted in and in the subsequent five years you are opting it out. In the, both of these scenarios, it is not happening. so again in my personal opinion tax audit is not required in this kind of scenarios yes sir sir i think there is a express provision in the act when you go for presumptive taxation it will be presumed ki jo bhi aapne kiya hai okay that is you know after giving effect to everything every kind of deduction it's i think the sub section start with sub not withstanding anything contained from section 28 to 43d that is how the section start according to me so it covers even 32 yes okay got it i'll come to this scenario very simple scenario say for example Last year I had opted in for 44 AD presumptive taxation. This year my turnover is seven crores and there is no cash expenditure, there is no cash receipt. Everything is on bank. As per section 44 AB clause A, because of the threshold limit, I am not required to do audit. Now the question comes to this angle: whether 44 AD four will apply or not, or whether 44 AD five will apply or not. In my opinion, it will not apply because by Force of law, you are getting out of this. You are not opting out. It's not voluntary. It is by operation of law. You are not covered by 44 AD. So there comes no question of applying 44 AD 4 to you. This is my personal opinion. Department may have a contrary view. And you, because you are covered by clause A of section 44 AB, and your turnover is below 10 crore and the expenditure criteria, you are not required to do audit. Absolutely, books of account is required to be given. Yes. Yes, in this scenario which we have discussed, definitely yes, definitely yes. Now, just four few judgments which are you know very fascinating and relating to ITR. 
I will be discussing at a fast speed now. Very fast is very interesting, a very fantastic judgment when I come when it comes to interpretation of statutes. Wonderful judgment of Karnataka High Court, recent judgment, two thousand twenty-two. Interesting scenario. Assessi had in this particular year brought forward business loss of forty lakhs. Brought forward business loss of forty lakhs. In this year, there was no business, there was no income, nothing. But this year there was capital gain of ninety eight lakhs from sale of land and uh, equipments or land or machine whatever some capital asset there was capital gains in this year. Now what Assessi did was Assessi ne capital gains jo aaya ninety eight lakhs ka what he did was against that capital gains he had set off that brought forward business losses against this. Now if by general reading of section seventy two if you say it says that seventy two allows you to set off your business losses against your business income during the year. And in the subsequent year, you can carry it forward, and you can again set it off against your business income itself. You cannot go into other house. You cannot go into other head when once you surpass the next year. I mean, in the next year, during the year, there is a possibility again, again at least against LTCG. You know, it is there is some criteria which you should comply. So special bench of ITAT, as well as the CIT lower authorities, stated that as per seventy two. You cannot set off your capital gains against brought forward business losses. Now the interpretation comes comes into picture. Section seventy two, subsection one. It says that whenever you are incurring losses, now please read under the head profits and gains of business and profession. They have used the word under the head of business and profession. So whenever you are incurring losses in that head, you first set it off against that same head. You see, head के अंदर दूसरे business है आपके उसकी income के सामने आप set off कर. If you are not, if there is still accumulated losses under the head of business and profession, then as per clause one, you can carry it forward to the next year, and in the next year you can set it off against profits and gains, if any of any business or. So यहाँ पे the High Court says that when it comes to during the year, Section seventy two subsection one says that under that head, whatever income you have earned, you can set it off against the losses under that. Head. But when it comes to the next year, when you are going to the next year, they have used the word it shall be set off against profits and gains. They have not used the word under the head. So now the High Court says that ultimately. ये जो भी सेलिंग ऑफ लैंड हुआ है फैक्ट्री बिल्डिंग हुआ है दैट इज नथिंग बट इज बिजनेस एक्टिविटी इट इज रिलेटेड टू दर बिजनेस मेरा कंपनी है कंपनी का बिल्डिंग है मैंने बेचा है फॉर द पर्पज ऑफ इनकम टैक्स आई एम बाई फॉर गेटिंग इन टू फाइव हेड्स अदरवाइज एवरीथिंग इज माई बिजनेस सो वॉट एवर इनकम इज अर्न फ्रॉम दिस एक्टिविटी ऑल्सो ओके वॉट एवर इनकम इज अर्न इवन फ्रॉम इवन दो इट इज ट्रीटेड एज कैपिटल गेन्स बट स्टिल फॉर द पर्पज ऑफ सेवेंटी टू सबसेक्शन क्लॉज वन इट विल इट विल बी अलाउड टू बी सेट ऑफ So your brought forward business losses will also be allowed to be set off against your current year capital gain, which is otherwise not in our head. It's something out of the box. See, shares ka. If I am a dealer in shares and I have long term capital gains, in that case, if I talk about One one two a, then I think there is a specific restriction given in that section, stating that no, I think even in that is it is possible no, why not? There is no provision in one one two a which prohibits you from setting off your other losses again one one two a. I mean in general the capital losses, but this is an interpretational issue which is always subject to litigation. This is a very classic case of interpretation. If you read this assessment, it's a very good case uh, which I think. Utility calculates directly, automatically. They pick up some figures. Okay, it may not allow, but if you want to stick to this stand, you have to make a representation and a paper form to the CBDT. There's a Bombay High Court judgment of uh, Samir Bojwani and SK Ventures, which says that just because ITR form does not allow, does does not mean that there is no law for that. I think the Supreme Court judgment of LIC Corporation in context of some other law, which says that. The forms will not override the statute. What the statute does not prohibit, you cannot prohibit by way of a form. 
all these are legal issues but yes if you want to take up a stand for that you can definitely go ahead your ma'am the factory building was there it's a capital asset no fixed asset mein tha that was the issue now another recent bombay court judgment a very simple judgment i'll say i'll just run, run through it we know that certain statutory forms are required to be filed okay if you want to claim certain exemption or tax audit report is required to be filed on time certain forms are required to be filed on time even by the chartered accountants 10 ccb etc okay so there was a delay in filing this particular form on the part of the chartered accountant and there was a delay of 36 days the cpc had disallowed this particular exemption because the chartered accountant certificate was filed belatedly before the high court it was pleaded that the chartered accountant himself or herself had accepted that it was lapse on her part on account of certain personal obligation high court uh, said that yes this severity you have to consider this okay the the important observation is that due to the default on the part of the professional the assessee should not suffer so this is a very important observation is given in this judgment okay that assessee should not suffer because of the professional because there was delay on part of the professional so if the if at all there is any sort of delay or something like that if you have a reasonable stand then yes it will be heard by severity or by the high court again interest under section 234 abc as the madam pointed out ki kabhi kabhi aisa hota hai ki you know in the subsequent year they are deducting the tds okay whereas you are in, offered your income in this year in that case also what happens is once you claim that amount as deduction they will disallow that amount of deduction of tds credit and they will also impose in interest under section 234 abc this is a judgment recent judgment of gurpreet mohan singh wherein the honorable itd stated that you cannot blame the assessee for this once it is proved that the deductor had deducted tax on it but he had defaulted in payment to the government treasury you cannot even recover the interest amount from the assessee you have to whatever you want to do you do it from the deductor not from the assessee <clears throat> again this satish coal trolling uh, storage lucknow tribunal is a judgment very important judgment when it comes to filing of form 10 cc with for atib in this case also our reference is made to cbd circular a very uh, good uh, i can say reference is made in this judgment it is stated that as per this particular provision it was stated that unless form 10 cc is filed on time you cannot avail the exemption under section atib so that was filed belatedly however before the uh, you know expiry of the time to file revised return the assessee had filed a revised return wherein form 10 cc was submitted to them so honorable itit in this case has referred to a civility circular of 1994 that circular is still in you know subsistence and it was held that in that circular is provided that whenever you want to make any adjustment under 1431 so this adjustment was made under 1431 because tax on it uh, this particular form was filed belatedly so this circular says that if the assessee is approaching the assessing officer okay within the limit of 1395 and uh, read with section 154 that is for rectification application along with that particular form then it has to be considered by the assessing officer so even this judgment can come to a rescue in so uh, in cases where there are delay in filing you know this particular statutory forms now coming to the last part of our discussion that is the annual information statement now first of all we look at the source of law the annual information statement or form 26 as earlier it was covered by section 203a 203a covered the provision of 26 as now that is completely omitted there is no 26 as which was there earlier now the relevant section is 285b which is covered you know the provisions of which are given under rule 115i and the rule 115i they have prescribed that there will be form 26 as and hence even today you are seeing form 2 and form 26 as this particular form 26 as captures various details and datas from various sources these sources are notified under this particular two notification which i have enlisted over here so yahan se reporting hota hai 285 ba ke andar 285 ba sft reporting is done based on that sft reporting and other sources based on this source of circular okay they are uh, they report the transaction in your 26 years now two years back our finance minister had announced that we will you know the scripture the entire utility in such a way that entire return will be filled so that was her statement in the budget speech wherein she stated that we will make a return filing so simple that entire thing will be prefilled in order to you know comply with this or in order to you know encourage this kind of uh, simplification they have come up with this e campaign under this e campaign there is no sort of law as such 
कि because under this particular section, this is there is this e-campaign. This is the administrative part. Everything is voluntary in this particular e-campaign. There is no law which mandates me to reply to this e-campaign. But what are, what will be the consequences of not reporting? We'll discuss it later. So this is the uh, I can say uh, certain points which are taken up from the manual or FAQ of the e-campaign. It is not my points. It is directly taken up from that particular schedule. The objectives are to collect taxpayer details and selected information for queries to promote voluntary compliance. This is the voluntary thing which, which is required to be done by you. Okay, so uh, this responses which you have filed under this particular e-campaign or to the AI statement will be processed by them and it will be helpful for them in pre-filling your return of income. So this is the way they have structured this particular e-campaign scheme. Now, there is a one, two categories. One is preliminary response and other is feedback on information on AIS. These are the two categories. The first category is preliminary response. Present only one category is there in case of non-filers. If, if you are a non-filer under the AIS information, you will get this preliminary response category. Well, as to, they will ask you, why are you non-filer? What is the reason for you not filing the return of income? So that is the drop down which they have given that your income is below tax and remain. You are covered by XYZ provision, etc. So this is a general reply. Only one question is asked over here, which is required to be given. Now, second thing, which is, you know, commonly being asked by many person as to how to comply to this AIS feedback, which they are, you know, now sending notices to us. So in this case, this is the second category that is feedback to the information in AIS. This functionality as such does not have any binding source of law. So in section Kendra you have to reply to this. Okay, this is an administrative part according to me. Now this particular functionality collects the information from various sources as notified in the particular notification and they will dump it on your portal. And on that portal, they will give you two categories. One is optional category, one is expected category. So in the expected category, the department expect you to reply to that category ki bhai, wo transaction kya hai? You have to give your feedback whether the reported transaction, whatever transaction report in that particular schedule, whether according to you it is correct or not. You have to give an answer yes or no, or you know, vice versa. So this is the optional scheme, is optional tab is always optional. Whether you want to opt in or uh, whether you want to fill it or not, it's upon you. But expected, they expect you to answer. Now, what are the drop down? What are the kind of answers which you are, you know, you can give to this each and every field of this particular tab? you must have seen that there are various kind of information like interest reporting. There is even reporting of all the shares transaction, mutual fund redemptions, okay, uh, securities transaction, et cetera, et cetera, immobile property transactions. So for each of this category under this expected tab, you will get, you will get a drop down and based on the drop down, they will process your information. So now you have to answer. So for example, there is a uh, transaction which is shown. Say for example, there's a transaction of mutual fund redemption which is shown. They will show you Entire transaction as per the reported, what was the date of acquisition, what was the cost of acquisition, what is the index cost of acquisition, what is the date of sale, what is the unit sale price, etc. etc. Everything is there. Now you have to say whether it is correct. If you say it is correct, then it will be reported directly into your AIS report. So we have to report AIS TIS. So in the AIS report, once you say that yes, it is a correct transaction, it will be accepted and it will be uh, you know reported as it is. That single value will be reported in the AIS schedule. If you say that information is not fully correct, so for example, you have some discrepancy with respect to certain amounts. So say for example, there is a reporting made of 10 lakhs, but as per you, the amount should be 7 lakhs, not 10 lakhs. So you are modifying that value now from 10 lakhs to 7 lakhs. So in this case, you have to report it. So if I show this schedule to you, this is the entire schedule. All the line items are there, quantity, rate, type of asset, everything is there. You have to give your feedback as per your understanding, as per your you know computation of income, and you have to provide your feedback. Once you provide your feedback to them, there will be like two values. One is reported value that is reported by the reporter that is under section 285BA, SFP transaction. Other second value will be the modified value. Modified value is the value which you have entered. And the third value will be the reported value. Reported value will be the Two values will be reported in your AIS statement. They will report both the values. Ki by SFT transactor and reporter ne kya report kiya tha aur aapne kya modify kiya. Both these values will be re reported in your AIS statement. Okay. So this will come uh, come into your AIS statement after you give your response to that. Okay. And this they have stated in this particular FAQ that once you give this detail, they will process it as per the risk management strategy. Okay. And if there is a significant variation from what has been reported 
then they even send the data to that again collector back to that collector and they will ask them if i issue a discrepancy hack up and then we we'll collect the data but in your ais whatever when you you will report even that will be reflected in your ais along with the reported value then there is a duplicate information say for example there is a transaction which is entered two times in that particular statement then automatically once you say that it's a duplicate transaction the value will be considered as zero so in your ais also earlier if you have not submitted any response then in that case two transaction will be reflected in your ais same value ka two times transaction will be reported but once you say that it is a duplicate value in ais it will be modified to zero ek rahega pura transaction dusre mein zero aa jayega and uske baju mein it will be even the earlier figure will be reported but here at least they will make some correction in the eis once you report it if you report it if you don't report it then again it will be like uh, the entire amount will be reported Okay. No. See, one is CST reporting, and other is CDS report. Hmm. Correct. No, but according to me, there is a separate category of information, and we have this notion that whatever is in, reported in AIS, it will is your income. No, as I am saying, if AIS me comes, then your income will not be there. No, the ITR will prefer it as your income. No, okay. So if if obviously if it is a GST turnover reported, then it will not take that as a preferred item for a return of income. Never, it will take that TDS wala rent wala item as a you know in your uh, schedule of rent income definitely, but not the GST. They have classified it in that way. you cannot say it is a duplicate no i don't think so ha separately yes yeah correct correct sir correct <clears throat> yes sir okay sir it's a legal issue it's a legal issue because otherwise if it is listed then you are not allowed to claim the indexation benefit that is expressly given once it is delisted and you are selling it okay there is no prohibition but department may take a contrary stand that cost of when you acquired it it was listed then there will be a categorization ki up to the date of delisting you cannot take uh, indexation and after that you can take it it is a legal issue sir so delist okay i don't think so that company will be in any way to report anything about it i don't think Company is a if you are having a private trans party transaction, only if it is covered by two eighty five B A then it will be reported. If the company is selling that shares to you, then it it might be reported because first of all it has to be a reportable entity for under section two eighty five B A to in order to get your transaction reported in uh, AIS. If you made a private trans party transaction and that party is not covered by the provision of two eighty five B A or rule one four E, then there comes no question of reporting in uh, to A to S F T. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, sorry, sir. Is yes. a technical issue, maybe. Yeah. Yes, sir. But strike off again, sir. Shares don't have any, right? Then what do we do? There is no shares. Before trying it, as per the provision of the company, like the shares are automatically scrapped. <clears throat> yeah, possible, possible. Yes. So another, sorry, sir. No capital, sir. All these are legal issues. Striking of itself of the company can result into transfer of capital asset. If I if I am the lawyer of that particular person, it is like you know you are striking it off, you are writing it off through my job. Will loss it? I'll claim it in that event. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not claim over that shares now. Now, another information category or the drop down is information relates to other parties. This is very important when it comes to joint purchase of property. 
बहुत टाइम ऐसा हो रहा है कि ओनली सिंगल पैन इज रिपोर्टेड और इन केस ऑफ पार्टनरशिप में ऐसा होता है इफ इट इज अनरजिस्टर्ड पार्टनरशिप फॉर्म द रजिस्ट्रेशन इज डन टू द पार्टनर्स पैन ओके देयर इज नो पैन ऑफ फॉर्म व्हिच इज इन्वॉल्वड इन द सब रजिस्टर ऑफिस बिकॉज़ ऑफ व्हिच द प्रॉपर्टी इज रिपोर्ट इन द 26 इयर्स और एआईएफ एआईएस ऑफ द पर्सन दैट इज अ पार्टनर एंड नॉट द फॉर्म so here definitely you are required to give the details that no this property does not belong to me it belongs to someone else so to specify the pan over there so i think to ye sab issue pehle the which were like unaddressable there are practical issues which are not been addressed because aisa koi mechanism hi nahi tha now there is this mechanism where they will ask you ki bhai aapka nahi hai to batao kiska hai okay and accordingly in your ais it will be modified yes पोर्टल वेर इन दे मॉडिफाई योर ए आई एस जो ए आई एस आएगा इट विल बी मॉडिफाइड टू द एक्सटेंट वॉट एवर यू हैव रिपोर्टेड okay and according to me b26 as b tis yes anything as per section 4 of the act nothing can override section 4 jo mera income hai utna hi tax hona chahiye chahe wo kidhar bhi kisi ne bhi kuch bhi report kiya ho that's it and if i uh, yeah i'll come down to faq which is given by the department themselves will come down to that before that this small category if the information is denied say for example someone has reported your transaction in their sft ओके साइटिंग रॉन्ग पैन सो आपका गलती से पैन डाल दिया है बिकॉज़ ऑफ व्हिच द ट्रांजैक्शन इज बीइंग रिपोर्टेड नाउ इन दिस केस द ट्रांजैक्शन इज नॉट बिलोंगिंग टू यू सो यू हैव टू डिनाई द ट्रांजैक्शन यू डोंट नो हूज ट्रांजैक्शन इट इज यू हैव टू जस्ट डिनाई इट ओके सो इवन दैट कैटेगरी इज गिवन ओया देन ट्रांसफर इज नॉट इन द नेचर ऑफ सेल सो समटाइम्स यू हैव गिफ्टेड सम प्रॉपर्टी टू समवन सो इट इज नॉट इन द नेचर ऑफ सेल वी हैव टू मेंशन दैट दैट देयर इज अ ट्रांसफर ऑफ प्रॉपर्टी बट इट इज नॉट नॉट इन द नेचर ऑफ सेल ओके So same way, income is not taxable. So there are certain exempt income which are reported, and they expect you to give the answer. So you have to reply to it that yes, this is an exempt income which is being reported. So once you give this answer, they will process it. If you are not giving this answer, they will directly transfer this data to the risk management strategy. And now, as per the new provisions of Section One Forty Seven, Explanation One, Clause One, okay, even if the information is received through risk management strategy, it will be a eligible criteria for reopening the assessment. Okay, so better that if there are a huge transaction where you already know that this is required to be properly reported, I will advise you to report it. Otherwise, there is no obligation by law to report this transaction. कि हाँ भाई ये मेरा है नहीं है. I have one client who is dealing regularly in mutual fund. There are more than five thousand entries in this AIS. Five thousand entries which are expected. So humanly, it is impossible for me to select each and every details. तो नाउ इन दैट केस विल हैव टू प्रैक्टिकली फाइंड आउट अ वे आउट कि भाई या तो मैं नहीं करूंगा असेसमेंट आएगा तो भी समझाऊंगा बिकॉज़ दिस आर द इंफॉर्मेशन व्हिच इज नॉट मैंडेटेड बाय लॉ फॉर मी टू गिव टू द डिपार्टमेंट ओके एंड मियरली ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ दैट असेसिंग ऑफिसर कैन नॉट से कि नहीं आपने इसका जवाब नहीं दिया स्किल नाउ आई एम एडिंग इट नो दैट इज नॉट पॉसिबल बिकॉज़ देयर इज नो सोर्स ऑफ लॉ फॉर दैट डेफिनेटली सर यस Correct, correct, correct. So you are saying that. Absolutely, sir. So it will facilitate. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely, it will facilitate the filing of return. Okay, very smoothly. But there are practical issues for that also. Time constraint, human resource constraint. Say, if I employ someone, I don't know how he is going to input the values. My brain and his brain may be different. Yeah. So now there is also one FAQ which is very important whether the information can be modified or not. Very important. So they have categorically stated that yes, you can modify. Once you file a reply, subsequently you see that there is error in filing that particular response to the yes. You have all right to uh, you know modify that. You have to give reason why you are modifying it. So it is like earlier response provided was my mistake or incorrect details were given or response was no longer valid. Now that response is no longer valid. Now or others, if you see like others, you have to give the reason to that. Why are you modifying? 
so that modifying thing is also been provided so nothing to worry about that now this is very important last part of my presentation departmental faqs now there will be always be a question there is a difference between 26 and ai what should i follow okay so this has been addressed by the department themselves i'll read the answer to this difference between income as shown in ai as 26 years income reflected in ai as 26 years are based on information received from different sources and the tax compliance made by different stakeholders these are made available to the tax payers for reference purpose for reference purpose tax payer should check this book of record and provide information in return as per the information available with them second part very important they should provide the information as uh, information available with them if there is variation between the tds tcs or tax payment as provided in 26 cs and tds tcs or tax payment provided in ais the tax payer may rely on tds payment provided in form 26 cs so here they have categorically stated that if there is difference between 26 cs and ais at the end kuch agar reconcile nahi ho raha you can go by form 26 cs and i as a legal profession i'll i'll say to you that there is no need to go even by 26 years if the 26 years is wrong you have to go by the act but yes to answer the query whether what to follow ais or 26 years department says follow 26 years so this is the last question probably sir yes sir so in 26 years ultimately everything is coming for sft okay but there will be some definitely there will be some balances or you know some things which may not be reported probably and now we have in the social media this last week we have come across a notice which was issued by some officer in jammu and kashmir udampur this was a notice calling for information under section 153 sub section 6 notice was issued to that particular ssc asking the details of the tax professional who has filed the return of income so such kind of notices are being issued now under section 136 to the ssc is seeking the information as to who have filed a return of income whether you have give, you had given the details of the deduction which are claimed by you or not to that c or not whether you yourself had verified the itr or it was the tax professional who had verified the itr all this kind of details are being asked now from the ssc so as a professional we should take care that we should take proper mrn from the ssc or proper documentation from the ssc because aage ja ke wo ssc apne sath hai nahi hai किसी और ने कुछ गलत इन्फॉर्म कर दिया देन आई थिंक यू विल बी कवर्ड बाय दैट पर्टिकुलर यू नो नोटिस एंड देन दे विल आल्सो कम बिहाइंड यू दैट व्हाई आई हैव रिपोर्टेड मिस रिपोर्टेड एंड एनीथिंग इफ मिस रिपोर्टेड सो यस दिस वाज आई थिंक द लास्ट पार्ट ऑफ माय प्रेजेंटेशन ओनली वन इंपॉर्टेंट एफएक्यू वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एफएक्यू व्हिच कम्स अप एवरी ईयर आई थिंक यू विल गेट्स द क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम माय आंसर दैट इज दिस इट इज नॉट गोइंग टू गेट एक्सटेंडेड Okay, due date is not going to get extended, so this is most frequently asked question. Yeah, so with this, I think uh, I'll rest my presentation for the day. We can take up uh, the question answer session uh, for the ITR. FN, yes, come here. <clears throat> Now, FNO as such is covered by the exception to section forty three of section five. It is not considered as speculation. It's a normal business transaction. Now. As per section, uh, as per para five point one four of the severity guidelines or tax audit, again for FNO they are saying that whatever you know premium paid, uh, you know yeah you have to take it in modulus that is your turnover. Simple. Tax audit guidelines says that that will be your turnover. If you want to opt in for forty four eighty, there is no bar on that. Even for presum, even you can opt for presumptive taxation in case of speculation transaction. I mean sorry, derivative transaction. Okay, but again, the turnover will be calculated as per the ICI guidelines. If the turnover is crossing that limit, then you cannot go for forty four eighty. Otherwise, you can go. Now, in section forty four eighty, if you are going by that, in my opinion, you directly have the figure of profit. You directly have the figure of profit. In my opinion, you have to report that figure as your profit. You cannot just assume eight percent or six percent, and turnover will be according to the ICI guidelines. I think. Okay, but it should. be within that particular limit that's it so if there is a loss there is no question of coming into 44 ad first of all now if you are maintaining your books of account that's it in that case practically how it is reported is what we do is whatever premiums wherein there is income we consider it is in the sale part 
and wherever there is losses, you know, what are script transaction and losses, we consider the debit side. So this is how we come to the net figure that this is the net loss. Absolutely. Some of them are directly showing the net figure in Schedule BP also. That is also there. But what we generally follow is to show the positive side on the credit side, negative side on the debit side, ultimately we'll come, come down the loss. In balance sheet, there will be nothing. No, it's a derivative. It will, it will be squared, squared off. Only your capital balance with the broker can be reported. Yes. So if you have capital balance with the broker, unke paas agar kuch deposit pada hai, if it is not squared off, if they are having something that you can report in your balance sheet. Yeah. Yes. If that is the only business, only then. Net loss, again, again, I will say that you are required to get your accounts audited only if you breach the limit given under section 44 AB. If your turnover is exceeding one crore and if there is a loss, yes, you are required to get your accounts audited. If the turnover is up to one crore, that is set up on 90 lakhs and you are incurring losses, but you are maintaining your books of account. According to me, there is no requirement to do, do audit. In earlier is what you already opted and this year you want to claim loss, then you are required to do audit. Is there any other questions? Yes, sure, 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 sir, sure. I'll take it. I'll take it. Yes, sir. It's possible because revision is allowed for any mistake or omission. So that is an omission. Yeah, I got a point, but you are not considered in this return. Uh, practically, uh, what I can suggest is if you know that there is an eligible and uh, legal I know, deduction, you can make a claim of that in your ITR, even in the original ITR. Then again, obviously, it is going to get disallowed in 1431. Then you again file it in the revised ITR. Just so that you have a track that at least you are reported even that in the original idea. Fair enough, fair enough. So this is a set of query which is given by our sir. He says that if there is a sale of rural agriculture land, which is not considered as such as a capital asset itself, where should we report the amount which is received from that particular <clears throat> asset on sale of that land? In my op opinion, whenever you are doing any agricultural activity, when you're agriculture, doing any agricultural activity, selling the agricultural stuff and you're earning income, that income is exempt under section 10. That is the income which is exempt under section 10, which is required to be reported in ITR under section 10. Whereas this is the case which is not exempt. It is not capital asset itself. So that is not falling under section 10 itself. If I go legally by the words of the act, according to me, it is not required to be reported in the ITR, the sale transaction, because it is not an exempt income. Oh, section 10 makes them near. That is not the capital asset itself. Okay. So according to me, it, it will be fine if you are not reporting it anywhere in the ITR. But if you feel that, yes, it is required to be reported, then in exempt income, they have line items of others. In that line of items of others, you can specify that this is amount is received on sale of agricultural, rural agricultural land. And you can specify the amount just for the sake of report. Yes, they are asking the sub clause, then which clause? No, you go to others. I had previous, uh, like a compensation of a student, I will report it. And I will do one of the agreement for that matter. Ultimately, I have gone in the years uh, of that. Because I have declared that under exempted income, and the department is, you tell us which is the clause under which we can grant you exemption. So that is a capital receipt, practically. So here also the one. Now the point is in AIS and TIF statement, this transaction is reflecting. Hmm. The farmer has sold for 85 lakhs and that transaction is reflecting. Perfect. Thing it is agriculture land, even 1% TDS is also not deducted by the other farmer Correct. who has purchased that you know, see, uh, land plot. Uh, so the point is that it is reflecting in AIS. So I have just read from your thing, mm -hmm. that being it is not taxable. I, I may report that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fine. Okay. Yes, it's a business activity. 
it is a business activity if you are not opting for 40 per day ideally before ideally real time <laughs> तो आगे तो टाइम ही नहीं मिलने वाला है चार दिन में रिटर्न फाइल इसको देख के बैठे सर मिनट सर जस्ट अ मिनट सर जस्ट अ मिनट करेक्ट ओके 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 सर यू वी हैड आई हैव माइसेल्फ एनकाउंटर दिस केस इन द बॉम्बे हाई कोर्ट इट वाज आवर ओन कॉल द जजमेंट ऑफ bullet train just came one year back in the it is same same thing had happened that under section 96 of the rftl act the compensation received from that particular metro sorry bullet train company that is a government company unse humko compensation mila for acquisition of our land okay and that was exempt from any kind of income tax under section 96 of the rftl act of that particular land law act however that particular company had deducted tds even though they are not required to deduct tds because of that it was reflected in 26 years and because when i file my return obviously it is going to you know uh, create a trouble for me so i had directly filed a writ petition before the bombay high court okay stating that this government company has done this which is wrong i could have admitted our uh, petition and they are told that this is not subject to tax they they should not have you know deducted tax on it they should reverse that so all these things remedies are there but it is out of the line of the idea You have to go to 264. You have to go through the appeals. You have to go through the writ remedy. Exactly same case what you said. Bullet. If you read, if you read the judgment, Sima Patel is the name of the judgment. Sima Patel versus uh, uh, IT department. Yes. It is. They are distributing for what purpose? It is a refund of fund. What? It is a refund of fund. It is your. I I think I will go by the concept of mutuality. If if it is my own fund which is coming back to me, then principle of mutuality will apply. If it is something which is owned by the society and then it is distributed, then it may be subject to taxation. That 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 is taxable in the hands of society, no sir. Yeah. Ah, then that chances are there. It may be taxed. Ah, then no, 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 no. It will be taxed in the hands of society itself. No, if it is received in the hands of society. Subsequent distribution after the tax payment, you can do anything. Society, society has to hear that that it is a refund of sinking fund, refund of reserve fund, Correct. refund of. इनकम एक्सेप्शन गिवन करेक्ट You can fight it that two thirty four is not applicable for some reason. I'll say that there is no exception given for that category. Sir, that particular case, taxable at the end of the society, and society giving a certificate. Who do you mean? There is a question now again. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, that is resolved, sir. That is resolved. Okay. Uh, any other sir question? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, someone else. Sunday, if I. So that that exemption under general general was earlier there. Sir, there is a specific FAQ of the CBDT on this. It says that for e-filing, that general will not apply. Payment of tax everything is online, so completely said no. CBDT circular of 1992 specifically provided that if the officer is closed on Sunday, you can file your return on the next day. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir
ओके एडवाइजेबल इफ द पार्टी हिमसेल्फ रिवाइज द प्रीवियस स्टेटमेंट अदरवाइज यू कैन डू हियर ऑप्शन एंटायर अमाउंट एंटायर यस 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 बट एडवाइजेबल दैट दे रिवाइज द स्टेट आई थिंक यस रिपोर्टिंग ओके सर वी कैन टेक अप दिस क्वेरी इन पर्सन वी कैन टेक अप दिस क्वेरी इन पर्सन ओके थैंक यू सो मच फॉर द पेशेंट हियरिंग इट वॉज it is said by george armani to create something exceptional your mind must be relentlessly focused on the smallest details so i think shashank has taken the smallest details which are required to file this year's ay 2023 24 returns and i think we'll be doing it very seamlessly now so thank you shashank on behalf of jv nagar 37 i thank you and i request you all to share around with us thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you ट 